They gave 600 milligrams of testosterone. I think it was, I forget what, I think it was a month. Maybe it was a week. It might have been a week. I don't remember exactly, but they gave him a testosterone. One group lifted weights. Another group didn't lift weights at all. Uh, one group did nothing at all. Another group just took testosterone and didn't do anything. The biggest surprise of the study, well, there was no surprise. The men that lifted weights and took, took testosterone made the most muscle gains. No surprise there. The big surprise came when they looked at the men that took testosterone but did no ex I mean, they did nothing. They still gain muscle. <laughs> they gain muscle sitting around doing nothing. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today was the science editor of Muscle and Fitness, Iron Man, and the editor at large for the well known Flex magazine. His insights into bodybuilding and nutrition are unique and extensive. Recognized by many of today's biggest names in the industry, including the former three times Mr. Olympia, Frank Zane. Today, he's the creator of Applied Metabolics an in-depth newsletter about nutrition, supplementation, exercise science, and steroids. Besides his writing, he has been a nutrition consultant for numerous elite world-class athletes, such as Floyd Mayweather Jr., Oscar De La Hoya, and Vasily Jurov. He was also a competitive bodybuilder himself and trained alongside Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 70s. Today, he spills nothing but the truth about the common mistakes most bodybuilders are making with their diet and nutrition, the pros and the cons, and the terrifying science behind steroids available today, and how many of today's seemingly safe testosterone supplements can have deadly consequences. So please welcome the creator of Applied Metabolics, Mr. Jerry Brainham. Thanks for joining us. Sure, happy to be here. I've uh, followed a lot of your wonderful videos on YouTube. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I it's, it's, as I followed yours. <laughs> thank you. And and it's and it's quite nice to see. Uh, I guess people, even people like myself, I put in that category to have made the transition from you. You were, I guess, when you started a lot of the education that you provide. It was very much in the print world, and, and right. you were very successful in that. That's and true. Being able to make the make the the switch over to the Digital space. Right. Well, I wasn't able to do that until the internet became more popular and widespread. I actually always wanted, I had a, a uh, my, my publication, Applied Metabolics, I had a print version in the late 90s. Uh, the internet was nothing like it is today. I mean, it was just barely there. Uh, and it was published by a, a magazine called Iron Man Magazine, Bodybuilding Magazine. Unfortunately, it wasn't marketed right. Nobody knew about it. I remember doing a seminar at a bodybuilding contest in Santa Monica. It was me, a guy named, famous guy named Dan Duchesne. I don't know if you ever heard of him, he called the steroid guru. He was famous years ago for giving out information about Barry's anabolic drug. And a doctor, it was an MD on the panel. And the, the guy who was uh, emceeing it announced me. He says, uh, Jerry Brainham, editor-in-chief of Applied Metabolics. And I'm looking at the audience, everybody's going like, what is Applied? And, and the two guys on the panel with me looked at me and said, What's applied? But nobody in the room had ever heard it. Not one person in the room had ever heard of it. Even though I had a little ad in the back of the bag, a little, uh, you gave me a little free ad. And I, and I learned the lesson of marketing because of that. It wasn't marketed. If it's not marketed, it dies. So, you know, I said to myself, uh, so I went back, you know, I was writing for the magazines for a couple of years. And then and the, and with 2008, things changed. You know, they had financial meltdown. And uh, the budgets of the magazines drastically changed because the bodybuilding magazines always depended on, on, on uh, sports supplements or, or food supplements. That's their livelihood, the advertising uh, 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 fees they make. But it turned out as the internet increased, companies decided to pull their ads from the magazines and put them on the internet. So the magazines, all of a sudden, their budgets went down to nothing. And I, I remember getting a call from one, one of the publishers. He says... We can't pay you anything anymore, you know. And I said, first they cut me from four articles a month to two, and then then about uh, maybe a year later, I get that call about he can't pay me, and I said to myself, well, uh, you know, this is my goodbye then because I am a professional writer, you know. I mean, uh, you know, I, I can't speak for this. I'm a professional. I can't work, and that's when I uh, started my my own. Uh, I look. I said to myself, now's the time to resurrect my publication, which I always wanted to do. And I'll tell you the reason why I was so interested. And not so much that I'm working for myself, which is good, but also because, I have to be frank with you, the magazines were so, they were so full of garbage and lies. I, I tried to tell the truth, but a lot of the stuff in the magazines was just purely adver advertising nonsense. 
They had gone so far astray. I wanted a magazine, I mean a publication that would give people the honest truth, the absolute truth based on my own experience with many years of training and, and study plus the, uh, the current science. So I wanted to do it for years, but to be honest with you, I was afraid to quit writing because I needed the income. I wasn't sure how it would take off. They forced my hand when, when, he, when he told me he can't pay me. And I started, and I can tell you today, my regret is that I didn't start it many years early. I should have had the courage and the self-confidence and the belief in myself that just started much earlier, but I, I did, but I'm, at least I'm doing it today. I enjoy doing it because as I tell people, when I research it, I always learn something myself. And the one thing that has not changed in, in my personality over my entire life is a love of learning and a love of reading. I mean, my attitudes towards bodybuilding and a lot of other things, life in general has changed radically, I'd say, in the last 40 years. But not that. I still absolutely get excited learning new things and you know, reading. I, I just really into that stuff. So it, it's a labor of love, I guess you could say. But with, with going back to some of the magazines when you, when you started, I know Flex was a big one I used to be a big right. uh, fan yeah. of. Were, in terms of what you could write about, were you limited in some ways? Because I, I, if you listen, listen to some of your YouTube videos, which are fantastic, mm -hmm. you, you can be quite controversial and you can, I guess, sort of almost like uh, disagree with what a lot of the stuff is that you hear yeah. out there. Was, was there certain limitations on what you would say in case it upset any of the advertising sponsors? Absolutely, absolutely. As, as I said earlier, a big hot, uh, hot topic, if you want to call it that, was food supplements. Because the magazines depended on those food supplement ads, I had to be very careful what I wrote. Frankly, I couldn't write the truth. Uh, so what I would do, I was never a dishonest person. I could not lie. So what I simply would do is not write about them at all. I just avoided them. Uh, there, there was a couple of forays, though, where I did write stuff based on absolute evidence. I'll give you two examples. I came across a study showing that using a very popular supplement called branched-chain amino acids, those are three essential amino acids, they had showed there was an increase in uh, what they call Lou Gehrig's disease in former football players who had used large amounts of branched-chain amino acids. And I pointed out that this is not a cause and effect relationship. In other words, it's only an end, you, you can't say that branched-chain amino acids is what caused the disease. It's just unusual that so many of these guys wound up getting this disease who had used large amounts. And I, I said, it does not mean in any sense, I emphasize, that branched-chain amino acids are dangerous. Well, the, the publisher of the magazine refused to run that article. That was the first case. Another case, and this is the one that really annoyed me, I'll never forget this, the French health agency, the equivalent of the Food Drug Administration of the United States, they issued a report saying that uh, creatine, which was already a very popular supplement, is a carcinogen and should never be used. And this was a, creatine was already a super pot. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I investigated it. I contacted the uh, original researchers who wrote this study that the French agency based that on. And what they told me was that creatine uh, could possibly turn into car a carcinogen if it's cooked at 300 degrees and more for extended times. It changes it into a carcin, just like meat. If you overcook meat, you get these uh, carcinogens formed called hydro uh, HCA uh, hydrocarbon something, I can't remember exactly. The, the meat can actually produce, uh, you know, especially when it drips down, if you're barbecuing, it can produce these carcinogenic substances. It only happens though when the meat is overcooked, you know, burnt, very well done, so to speak. So the point is, I, I pointed this out in the article, and then I went into a, a huge amount of information about why creatine is safe, and nobody who takes a creatine supplement is going to cook it or broil it, and it's a meaningless, stupid report. It should be ignored. I thought I was doing a good thing, they wouldn't run the article because 90% of the ads for the magazine pushed creatine supplements. Right. They refused to run it. This is the kind of stuff I had to deal with. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow, a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. 
Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. So with, with the internet today and social media, how do you cut through a lot of the, uh, I suppose, false information? There's, there's obviously a lot of agendas. Oh, yeah. The supplement industry is a big industry. There's a lot right. of money behind it. I guess there's a lot of governing bodies also that have certain alignments and allegiances with different things. So mm -hmm. for the person on the street that kind of gets these snippets of information from Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and obviously wants to do the right thing without putting their selves at risk, how does the average person determine what's hype and, and, and has an agenda behind it and what is going to be good, solid information that you can make sure that you're not going to be ingesting something for several years that could probably create serious risk. There's a couple of things you can look for, and that is a problem, and I'll tell you what answer the problem. What answer the problem is many of the people with advanced degrees, such as PhDs and MDs, are hired. Some of these supplement companies have big pockets. They have, uh, they're making a lot of money, and what they do is they sign these professional, medical professionals to contracts Basically, these medical professionals endorse the products. And the way most people's minds work, if you've attained an advanced degree like a doctorate or an MD, you must be an expert. In fact, if you look at most vitamin bottles, they'll say, for, for more information, consult your health professional or physician. They consider the ultimate authorities on health and supplements. First of all, first of all medical doctors have no training in nutrition. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's not required to get a medical degree. Uh, I forgot the category it's in, but if they, even if they do study, it's something like two hours. It's nothing. They know how to recognize nutritional deficiencies. That's it. They know nothing about the nuances of food supplements. But, you know, these people see these doctors and these uh, PhDs endorsing it, and they figure it must be scientifically, it must be correct, and they buy it, and the companies make millions off that. So the first thing to do is be careful when, you, when you're looking at, at a, considering buying a food supplement, something you've seen online, uh, something in the YouTube uh, videos. Uh, look who's behind it. Uh, you know, make sure that these guys are not uh, on the payroll. I'm talking about the medical professionals or whoever, where it's a top trainer. Make sure they're not being paid. Uh, for example, I saw. Uh, I t tend to look at these uh, videos uh, related to anti-aging stuff because I'm getting older myself. And some of them are right. You know, they interview top researchers. But I notice they always are pushing these, they have long lists of supplements, and they say 20% off if you use this code. And then I realized they're, they're shills, they're on the payment, they're on the payrolls of these supplement companies. So this, to me, that loses all credibility. I, I don't believe a word they say. So I, I would advise people to look behind the curtain and see who's, you know, see if these people are on the payroll. And also you have to have what they call a little bit of critical thinking. In other words, don't accept things on face value. Don't say because Dr. Uh, Smoleski says that this uh, amino acid thing is going to put on 40 pounds. Don't stop there. Do some research on your own. They have many sources on the internet. PubMed, which is the, uh, the uh, National Library of Medicine, you can look up the, and see what studies back up this particular supplement. I'll give an example of that, another example. There's a researcher... I you don't want to get into a fight with this guy, but he has, he, apparently he's a neuroscientist from Stanford University. He's an intelligent guy. Most of what he says is true. I have no beef with him. However, he mentioned on a uh, podcast with a guy named Joe Rogan, uh, he mentioned something, that, uh, Joe Rogan asked him for supplements that increase uh, testosterone. He mentioned an herb called fedosia, which is an African herb, right? He says it will definitely raise, and he mentioned something called Tonget Ali, which is another herbal supplement from Malaysia. He mentioned those two. And, you know, and I, I said to myself, Fedosia, because I had written about that in my newsletter. I wrote about herbal testosterone boosters. And I remembered that Fedosia only has two studies behind it, and they're with rats. 
There are, is no human efficacy studies, no, not a shred of human evidence that it increases testosterone. And even worse, in one of the rat studies, the fedosia caused damage to the testes, the part of the testes that produces testosterone when, when given to the rats in larger amounts. And you know how people are. A lot of people, when you tell them to take two tablets, they'll take four, five, and six. If they do with this stuff, they can actually have a reverse effect and lower their testosterone. So this is an example, and they can, you can find this on the internet. You can go right, it's right there. You can see the studies. Two rat studies, that's it. Why this guy said that, I don't know. With Tongan Ali, he was a little bit on the mark. But what he didn't say, and what I know about Tongan Ali, that's one of the few herbs that can actually raise testosterone. One of the few herbs. There's only one problem. It only really works if you already have low testosterone levels. If you're a man or a young man or a middle-aged man or whatever, and you have normal to high testosterone levels, it does literally nothing. Nothing at all. You have to have low. If you have low, it'll kick out something called luteinizing hormone from pituitary. That controls testosterone uh, synthesis uh, in the body. It will help a little bit. So that, that is partially true. But he didn't say that. He didn't go into detail. I don't know the motives of this guy. I don't know the man. But my point being, by telling you this antidote, is here's a guy who has absolutely uncontestable academic credentials, but is still wrong. Mm. So my point being, again, uh, I'm trying to underscore the fact that, uh, and I'm not trying to put anyone down. I'm not jealous because I don't have a PhD. I'm just saying you have to have critical thinking. Don't rely, uh, look at them as the ultimate authorities who cannot be wrong because they're human. Anybody could be wrong. I'm wrong a lot of times. I've written things that have turned out to be dead wrong. I admit it. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, years ago, they, <laughs> they came out, uh, actually twice, they came out with a supplement called ribose. Ribose is a natural uh, supplement. Uh, it's a natural substance. Uh, it's involved in, in a DNA uh, in, 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 uh, in human studies, when it's given intravenously to people with congestive heart failure, it actually helps ease some of the problems of congestive heart failure because with congestive heart failure, you have a failure to produce enough ATP, which is the elemental energy uh, uh, component produced by, uh, of all cells. So the ribose, if you give it in large amounts intravenously, it does help. Now, here's the key, uh, the key uh, part of that statement is it helps increase ATP. Now, if you relate that to somebody involved in sports or exercise, anything that would increase ATP, that's energy. So it'll increase the intensity of workouts. If you're a sprinter, you'll be able to run faster. Taking this aside, a company decided to start marketing ribose supplements. And what they did is they, they, uh, they, uh, they uh, basically, ribose is, is kind of reconstituted uh, it's called a salvage pass pathway, but they, uh, you know, the guy who started the company actually had a biochemistry. He was a PhD, in, and he came up with some information showing that when you're heavily involved in sports and exercise, when you're training intensely, the salvage system is not as effective, so you don't get as much ribose as you need. Based on that, he felt that by providing supplemental ribose, you'll actually boost your ATP and get all the benefits, right? He recommended a dose of five milligrams a day, which is not bad. Uh, and I wrote to him, and uh, I, I, I wrote the article. I interviewed him twice. One was a Q&A, a question and answer. The other one just was a general information article about everything known about ribose in simple language so people could understand, no technical terms. And basically, it was kind of a subtle endorsement on my part of ribose. But based on the current science, and this guy did have a PhD, I made the same mistake. He had a PhD in bio biochemistry, and you know, I forgot the fact that he was head of a company that was selling the product. I didn't take that into consideration. I just figured he's an educated guy, knows what he's talking about. So I wrote these articles. About six months later, you know the, the expression, putting it to the test? Well, a couple of physiology journals put supplemental ribose to the test. They gave not five milligrams, they gave 20 milligrams. Four times more, five, is it? Yeah, five different, four times more than the, the recommended dose. Athletes, bodybuild, no effect whatsoever, nothing. Hmm. I gave the guy the benefit of the doubt. I called him, this is the, the head of the company, the biochemist, called him, emailed him, called him numerous times, and I sent him the studies. I said, please comment on this. No answer. <laughs> he never responded. So I had to publicly, about a, two months later, in, in the passing of, of an article, I, I didn't write it specifically on ribose, 
I mentioned how I was wrong about ribose and I don't recommend it. I said, I don't think it's a worthwhile supplement except when used in medicine in large doses, let's say to treat heart disease, very effective. And maybe in some people with a certain disorder called chronic fatigue syndrome, it might help also if you take a little bit larger doses. For everyone else, nothing. Mm. Another supplement like that is HMB. Have you heard of HMB? HMB, no, I haven't. Okay, HMB is, he's shaking his head. Okay, HMB is a uh, little bit of a short background. HMB is a metabolite of a branch chain amino acid called leucine. Leucine is the key amino acid for stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Muscle protein thin- synthesis, synthesis, <laughs> synthesis is stimulated by essential amino acids. There's nine of them. Three of them are branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Of the three, leucine's the key. What it does is it inhibits a protein that blocks the activity of another protein called the mammalian target of rapamycin, or mTOR. It gets a little complicated, but the point is a couple of veterinary researchers years ago at the University of Iowa, working, they were trying to figure out ways of increasing uh, protein, making leaner cattle. Uh, This is strictly for the uh, 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 husbandry, if you want to call it that. And they came across this HMB, which was almost nobody knew about. It wasn't used for anything. It just happened to be in the, you know, in the pathway. Leucine is turned into uh, HMB. So they decided to uh, see, well, let's give this HMB and see what it does. Sure enough, the cattle started gaining muscle and a light bulb went over their head. They immediately even before they published a human study, they immediately took out a use patent on human usage of HMB to increase muscle. They hadn't even published the studies yet. They saw the potential. They said, if this stuff makes cattle gain muscle like that, (laughs) it'll probably do the same in humans. So sure enough, they published a couple of human studies and what they found, great. The the bodybuilders, uh, well, they will usually use untrained men, which right away is a problem, you know. When you use untrained people in studies, anyone can tell you, it's established scientific fact, anyone who begins weight training, men, women, it makes no difference, you're always going to make gains in, in, when you're untrained. That's the way the body works. The first three months, it's a neuromuscular thing. There's a better brain-muscle connection. You get more strength and size. After about two months, you start getting the muscle size. But it happens with everyone. So untrained people, for, right off the bat, are not good subjects. So they did this study, they gave HMB, one, they did a controlled study, one group got three grams of HMB, one gram three times a day, the other group got a placebo. The group that got HMB, bench press strength went up, muscle size went up, it works. They published two more studies, right? Again, untrained college students, it works. And then a couple of entrepreneurs caught on to this. One of them was named Scott Connolly, who's, uh, you probably never heard of him, he was an MD, anesthesiologist. He developed a product called Metrics. I don't know if oh, you know. I know Metrics. He, yeah. pro- he developed, I knew Scott Connolly, he, he developed Metrics. At the, he got into a partnership with a guy named Bill Phillips, right, yeah. who was at, uh, he had Muscle, uh, was it Muscle 2000 or something like that? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was the, it was the body changing Right, right, that's program. what he did later on. I can't on. think what it was called. But, but. he started, uh, uh, Phillips started out with a newsletter. And Phillips gained a reputation of great honesty because what he would do, he would take steroids, uh, you know, underground, you know, uh, black market steroids, and have them analyzed and tell and list the results in his newsletter. He'd identify the fakes, and this was a great service mm. to all the athletes in body. But he became very popular, and he had this reputation of utter honesty. And he himself worked out; he looked pretty good. So he wound up getting into a partnership. Uh, with uh, Connolly, uh, first with Metrics, and then Connolly saw the research from the University of Iowa on HMB. He got, he paid them to a license fee to start marking HMB. And then Phillips, you see, Connolly was the brains you could say behind it. Mm-hmm. Very smart guy, strange guy, but very smart. He liked me because when I interviewed him once, he took a tablecloth in a restaurant and he wrote out the entire Krebs cycle. And I started identifying the, the parts of it before he wrote it, and he was shocked. He, he literally had a look of shock on his face. He had never, he, Connolly's one of those guys that, he's very smart, but he, he can't stop talking tech speak. He doesn't know how to you know, talk in normal English. He always uses these highly technical, and he had come across a guy like me who suddenly knew what he was talking. And I'm trying to say I'm super intelligent. I just happened to, I studied biochemistry in school, so I recognized it. That's all it was. 
But anyway, uh, Connolly teamed up with uh, Bill Phillips, and they Connolly they paid a license fee to the University of Iowa researchers, and they came out with an HMB supplement, right? And the HMB supplement, uh, uh, the the marketer uh, Connolly was the brains, but the market man was Bill Phillips. Tremendous marketing ability. I mean, I, this guy was great. I have to say, what he did, he, he started issuing statements. He says. HMB works like DECA. DECA was a reference to an anabolic injectable steroid called DECA Durablin. Nandrolone decoinate is the uh, generic name. Works like DECA. Now remember, Bill Phillips had that reputation of honesty, so people started buying HMB like crazy. There was only one problem. HMB didn't work in people who had a trading history. In other words, if you had been working out for a couple of years, it did literally nothing. It only worked for very distinct categories. Well, who it worked for was older people who are very frail, because what HMB did was it, it didn't have the same, uh, uh, it was only something like one-tenth as effective as leucine in increasing muscle protein synthesis, but it was more powerful than leucine at preventing muscle breakdown, what they call catabolism. So because of that, it was of use to older people who were very frail, had a condition called sarcopenia, where they were losing muscle with age, if you were overtraining, which a lot of athletes and body, you know, HMB could be of use because it'll help prevent some of the muscle breakdown. The third category was ranked beginners, as they showed in the HMB studies. You take HMB, it will give you a little bit of edge, it will. Everybody else, zero, nothing, absolutely nothing, total waste of money. The point is that this, was a, uh, this is the kind of thing where, you know, uh, if I wrote about that in the magazine, getting back to what you asked me, it would never be published. Uh, uh, luckily, uh, I did write, one of the first articles I wrote in my, uh, my publication, they had come out with a, uh, a newer form of HMB. The HMB sales had died off because they came out with a number of studies showing that it did nothing for advanced trainees. And the people that tried HMB noticed that it did nothing. So the popularity dropped. So they had to come out with it. So they came out with a, what they call a free form HMB. Because HMB normally, the original one, was in a tablet form complex with a mineral like calcium that was supposed to keep it stable. They came out with a free form. Now what they said about the free form, again, hyperbolic uh, comments, they said it's absorbed much faster than H uh, the uh, original HMB, and it was far more anabolic. One guy who, again, here we go again, this guy was a, a researcher with a legitimate PhD on the payroll of the company that had bought the licensing fee for exclusive sales of free HMB. He was on the payroll. He comes out and makes videos saying that uh, HMB puts, uh, uh, he says, I just did a study where the people put on 12 pounds of muscle in a week with free HMB. <laughs> and right away, people said, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no anabolic steroid or growth hormone in existence that could put on 12 pounds in a week. Something's wrong. So the, a couple of actual other scientists, independent scientists, analyzed the study. Sure enough, it was severely flawed. It was manipulated, see? So, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. I found out about, I found, oh, oh that, this is what I wrote about. Then they came out with a study comparing the 10 times more expensive freeform HMB with the original much cheaper calcium HMB tablet the calcium HMB worked much better in, pre in, in preserving muscle than the free HMB. It turns out the free HMB was rapidly broken down, just like amino acids. See, you know, when you take amino acids in free form, uh, unfortunately, if you take a good amount, the liver oxidizes them very rapidly. So most of them don't even get into the blood. They have no anabolic effect. Uh, and the, the, which is interesting now is a, company, a couple of companies, to show you how deceitful, deceitful some of this advertising, this company's uh, selling amino acid supplements. They're not identifying them. As, they say this new protein supplement, uh, and they uh, has absolutely, is 100% absorbed, has 100% absorbed, and has no wastage, whereas only 18% of whey protein is absorbed. The rest of it is excreted out of it. Completely false information, right? But what they don't say is that essential amino acids, again, the liver oxidizes them. When they've compared amino acid supplements to, let's say, whole proteins like whey protein, the whey protein produces much better anabolic effects because you have a gradual absorption. 
Amino acids are much better absorbed in a gradual manner rather than you've given them in a free form. And I'm not saying uh, amino acid supplements are junk, but I'm saying is it's completely deceptive advertising to mm -hmm. say that essential amino acids are 100% absorbed, giving the impression that you're gonna get huge muscles from them and whey is junk. Get rid of your whey. It's 18% of so you're just pissing out. It's a waste. So what Come is it if, if people on, on that <clears throat> subject, I'm, I'm interested as well, like for, for amino acids, like should you take them? And if so, what's the best way to get them into your system then if, in, in terms of building muscle? Well, like I say, I wouldn't discount essential. First of all, we have to understand something. Uh, you have amino acids, a general term. There's 22 uh, established amino acids. Of the 22, nine are considered essential. What essential means is that they cannot be manufactured in the body. They have to be taken from food sources. The other, now, people take this wrong. They say, well, essential amino acids, and the other ones are non-essential. That means the non-essential ones are useless. No, not at all. Some of the non-essential ones do have definite health effects, like taurine. There's a couple of them that, that are really useful. But in terms of muscle building, for muscle synthesis, muscle protein synthesis, you need the nine essential amino acids including the three uh, branch chain amino acids. Those are part of the nine essential. Now, they talk about, remember I, earlier I mentioned how leucine is the most potent amino acid at stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Again, what people overlook is that, is that leucine does not work in isolation. Unless you have all nine amino acids present at the same time, leucine does nothing. And, and, and if, not, if, if even one of the essential amino acids is missing, all the amino acids are excreted out of the body. They all have to be there, mm -hmm. right? Now, what are uh, amino acids are useful in certain people that, for example, maybe you have protein, uh, di a little bit of a problem digesting protein. Uh, maybe older people encounter a condition, which I actually just wrote an article about, called anabolic resistance. Anabolic resistance has several causes, but uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of it has to do with inability to absorb amino acids sufficiently into muscles. It leads to sarcopenia, loss of muscle frailty, and so on and so forth. If you give these people extra amino acids because they are absorbed more easily, it probably helps in that situation. Uh, if you, for example, are a competitive athlete or bodybuilder, and let's say you are, are, are in a type of situation where you're on a diet, you want to lose body fat, and you're doing a lot of aerobics, uh, you know, if you overdo aerobics, you tend to start to burn the uh, muscle. You start to Turn, they break down the muscle, uh, particularly the branch chain amino acids that are stored muscle. They, they, you, they're basically taken out of the muscle, sent to the liver where they're converted into glucose, a process called gluconeogenesis. If you give exogenous amino acids, even branch chain amino acids, but basically essential amino acids, you, act, you put a break on that. In other words, you're, you're sacrificing the uh, supplemental amino acids instead of the muscle amino acids. That might help. So I always tell people, if you're afraid of losing muscle, because a lot of uh, bodybuilders always say, I don't do aerobics because I'm afraid of losing muscle. Simple. Take some amino acids about an hour before you train. Your body will not touch your muscle. They'll burn up the amino acids. You don't care about them anyway. You just want to preserve your muscle. So, and would you take that in? Would, would you have your amino acids within some kind of protein powders then, or would you just have separate? Well, they, they, they sell separate. Uh, like I say, some of these newer supplements... They're nothing more than essential amino acids. That's all they are. Mm. So you could take that. You could take it in a powder or, or a tablet form. Or you could take a, a regular whole protein. You're automatically getting, or, uh, I mean, uh, whey is loaded. Whey protein is loaded with essential. It's 16% branch chain amino acids. It's loaded with amino acids. So it, it's up to you either way. My personal feeling is that uh, if, you're, if you're consuming enough dietary protein, and what I mean by that, I'll, I'll give you a figure, uh, somebody who wants to gain muscle for whatever purpose should be consuming 1.2 to, uh, actually it's uh, 1.2 to 2.2 grams of uh, protein per kilogram of body weight. 2.2 uh, 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 kilo, uh, uh, kilogram, uh, I'm so sorry. A pound a pound. 2.2, 2, yeah, that, that's about a pound, of, uh, 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 I'm sorry, a gram of muscle per pound of body weight, the 2.2 figure. Right. So that's the requirements, say, for, for, for gaining muscle. So uh, where you get it is irrelevant. In other words, uh, uh, you can get it from food, uh, but my point is that if you're eating enough, if you're getting that range of protein, there's no need for really supplemental protein or supplemental amino acids. I mean, because the excess protein, 
you know, the, the idea that uh, there's another myth that you can only absorb a lim limited amount of protein. And that's a confusion because what they found is the, when it comes to muscle protein synthesis, there's a limit. About 30, 30, gra 30 grams in men under 40, that maximizes muscle protein synthesis at one sitting, at one meal. If you're older, because of anabolic resistance, you have to take a little more, maybe 40 to 50 grams. Now, does that mean that all the other protein is wasted? No, it's used for other things, you know, skin, hair, nails, blood, all, you know, uh, internal organs, right? And, but people have taken this to say that you could, and I was, I believed this for years myself, that you could only absorb 30 grams of protein a meal. There's no limit to how much protein you're, there is no limit. You right. can absorb any amount of protein, but, the limit is on how much will be used for muscle protein synthesis. Okay. That's where the confusion right. lies. And is there any, have you seen any particular proteins that, because you know, we've done a few in episodes on protein itself, right. but have you seen any that are particularly good, efficient, effective, and don't have a lot of junk in, or do you not sort of recommend things in, in that level of Okay, detail? that's a very good question, because there's a real problem with protein supplements. The problem with protein supplements is, it's an interesting story, because whey, started out as a byproduct of cheese manufacture, manufacturing. You, you have two major proteins in milk. One of them is whey, which is 20% of milk protein, and the other 80% is casein, right? Now, in the manufacture of cheese, whey was considered a waste product, and they dump it in rivers and stuff. It's just thrown away. And then somebody actually, some scientists along the way, I don't know who, <laughs> looked at the amino acid composition of whey and he said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. This stuff is really good. It's loaded with essential amino acids and all this. So uh, a guy, uh, I can't remember his name, this guy in the 30s, actually way, goes way back to the 1890s, Eugene Sandow, the, which is the archetypical bodybuilder, he was literally the first bodybuilder, he actually endorsed a product that was made from whey. They didn't know the nutritional product. Nobody knew what whey did. They just kind of took it out of the air, and I'll tell you what, because it was dirt cheap. It was highly profitable. And they, he sold, I don't know whether it was a cracker or something, but it was based on whey. And whey was like a quarter of a penny was so cheap so they could make a profit. Later on, uh, his name was Schiff, Eugene Schiff. Uh, a supplement company was named. He started something later on called Schiff Supplements, which Joe Weider bought years later. He was the first guy to come out with a commercial whey product. But it was green. It was horrible tasting. It made you vomit. You could not and he abandoned it. Whey didn't become popular until the early 90s when they, decided, they started to process whey in such a way, <laughs> whey in such a way, yeah, <laughs> that, that it, it became very tasty. Uh, there was one called uh, Designer Protein, which w w became a huge seller. It was a very tasty, it was a, a, a whey protein. Now, what happened was whey protein originally wasn't that expensive because it was, in, you know, there was an abundance of it. As whey, just like anything else, supply and demand, the law of economics, mm -hmm. as something becomes more popular, the, the price goes up, see? So in the last couple of years, they dramatically increased the, the price of raw whey material. So what the, you know, the, the, pro, the protein companies that sell whey, they, they, you know, they ha had to make a choice to, 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 uh, to buy this increased wholesale cost of whey. They would have had to raise the cost of their products almost to the point where it's unaffordable. I mean, $100 a can, nobody's gonna buy that. So they had to come up with a plan. They said, how can we sell, still sell the whey, keep the price reasonable, and still make our profits? So what they decided to do was, uh, was they added amino acids to the uh, whey protein. Now, uh, they measure the uh, protein content of, uh, let's say, a whey product by the nitrogen content, in other words, and amino acids, of course, that's what makes protein unique, that it contains nitrogen. Carbohydrates and fats do not. Now, by adding amino acids, you increase the nitrogen content of the protein. What does that mean in practical terms? You can sell a protein that where on the label, it says each scoop contains, let's say a whey protein, each scoop contains 25 grams of protein. But the fact that it's spiked is the term, or uh, uh, there's another term for it. I think it was, amino acid spiking is a common term where they add these amin cheap amino acids, but it increases the nitrogen value. So the nitrogen content is still equal to 25 grams of protein, but what you're actually getting is 12 grams of protein. 
because the amino acid, it's not the full amount. This allows them to put in actual less whey, therefore, they could, you know, they, it accounts for the, the, the greater uh, cost they're paying for the wholesale, and they could still make their profits, but the consumer is being screwed because he's paying the same price he paid before, but for half the amount of actual weight. So the point is, what I would tell consumers is if you're considering buy, buying, let's say, a whey pr uh, protein, do not buy anything that, because they, 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 they're so devious, they list the added amino acids as a feature. It'll say on the label, whey protein with added glutamine, added taurine. And, the, you know, a guy who doesn't know about nutrition will say, wow, this is not just whey. It has all these extra amino acids. It must, they don't realize they're adding the amino acids, but they're ripping you off. So my point is there are whey products that don't contain amino acids. Those do contain the full amount. They're a little more expensive. They are. Because of, again, because of the wholesale price of whey. So, you know, you, you look for just, if you're gonna buy, buy a whey protein isolate with no added amino acids. Don't, otherwise, you're ripping yourself off. What, whilst we're talking about <laughs> supplements, one of the things that seems to sort of be around quite a bit, um, you know, you get stuff sent, you see it online, is these testosterone boosters. Ah, and yeah. I, I kind of had a look, and you, you did a bit of a, a video for those. It seems like people are, consider it as a safe alternative to real testosterone. But, but t tell me a little bit about those. What are they? Do they work? Yeah. Are they junk? Right. What's your view on well, that? Well, there's two categories. Uh, the first one is what I uh, alluded to earlier when I mentioned the herbal testosterone. Uh, herbal testosterones, again, uh, two examples are Fidocia agrestis and Tongat Ali, also called Long Jack. Uh, uh, these work, uh, usually they work within your own body to increase testosterone. For example, uh, 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 Long Jack or, or uh, uh, with Tongat works by supposedly increasing the release of a pituitary hormone called luteinizing hormone, which is the rate li limiting hormone in the body for testosterone synthesis. It's released by the pituitary. Well, first it's thought you have gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. That travels through a portal system in the brain, the anterior pituitary, which then kicks out luteinizing hormone, travels in the blood to the testes, when it gets to the testes, it stimulates the conversion of cholesterol, which is delivered to the testes via low-density lipoprotein in the blood, <laughs> through uh, five enzymatic steps, starting with preg uh, prognanolone, the, the cholesterol is converted into testosterone. So the herbal, I know this is a long-winded way of answering, but the, the herbal uh, supplements, a lot of them work by trying to stimulate luteinizing hormone. So it works within your own body. So that's one category. The other category, are, and these are not as uh, uh, available as they were a couple of years ago. These were the uh, drug uh, testosterone boosters. What, it's very interesting. What they did is uh, there was a book written in 1968 uh, by a guy named Julius Vida. And what he did is he documented every known anabolic steroid that was ever researched, and he listed their chemical non, non, you know, formula. So if you were a steroid chemist... You knew, and you knew how to manipulate you know, drugs, you could produce them. Now, what happened to all these steroids? They were, they were all produced by major pharmaceutical companies, but the majority of them in animal experiments proved to be so toxic that you know, they caused liver failure, cancer, that they were never released on the market. Or they, even if they weren't toxic, they just showed no superiority over existing steroids like testosterone, nandrolone, Anavar and all these other ones, so they weren't released either. They were in uh, uh, you know, dormancy for years. So then somebody got the idea uh, of, uh, it actually started in the late 90s, uh, a, a guy who, uh, I can't remember his name of him, but he had a chemistry degree, and he decided that he wanted to get rich, so he came out with the first, uh, let's say, uh, uh, drug-based drug -based supplement, it was called androstenedione. It is made in the body. It's, remember that pathway I talked about where cholesterol, it's in the pathway. It's, it's right before uh, uh, testosterone's form, you have androstenedione, then testosterone. So theoretically, by taking an androstenedione supplement, you could increase testosterone. That was the theory. And they show, sure enough, uh, early studies in the, in the late 60s with women showed when they took androstenedione, they start, testosterone does go up. So based on that, this guy 
uh, you know, came out with this androstenedione supplement. Now, what he didn't say, but what, which, well, I'll say here, is you might have heard of something called dehydroepiandrosterone, DHEA. Have mm -hmm. you ever heard of that? DHEA always increases testosterone in women. Always. In men, almost never. It's a, just a sex difference. <laughs> so the, bit, the first mistake this guy made was assuming that because androstenedione increased testosterone in women, mm -hmm. that it would do in men. But he didn't, he didn't bother. He, he saw the dollar signs. He marketed it. Well, he didn't market it. He got together with a company. They marketed and androstenedione. And, and, and then, what really made it famous was there was a home run derby around 1997 between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sousa. They were trying to set the home run record, the all-time home run record. And they were going for, uh, they wanted to beat Babe Ruth's record. I believe it was, what, 61 home, 60 homers and this and that. And, and, uh, and they were interviewing Mark McGuire in the locker room after a game. He'd already hit like 50 homers. And they noticed this bottle in his locker. And they said, Mark, what is that? And they noticed on the, it said androstenedione. He said, oh, it's a food supplement I'm taking. It's nothing. OK, well, well, one of the reporters, the more intrepid reporter, decided to research androstenedione. And he found that it could increase testosterone. You see, it was already being marketed. This is the very first testosterone booster, andro. They called it andro for short. So they started to say, well, McGuire's using steroids. That's why he's hitting these home runs. It's not him, it's the steroids. They actually sent a crew from Fox Sports into Gold's Gym when I was working out. And, and uh, they went to the front desk, does anybody here know about steroids? And they pointed to me. <laughs> so these, this guy brings the cameras over and the, and the, you know, the interviewer. He says, do you know about steroids? I said, I know a little about steroids. He says, can we ask you a couple of questions? I said, sure. They said, did you, did you hear about Mark McGuire uh, you know, using androstenedione supplements? I said, I sure did. He says, he says, don't you think, he goes like this, isn't that the reason why he's hitting these home runs? I said, no, not at all. <laughs> I said, check his background. Mark, I said, uh, uh, Mark McGuire hit his first home run at age 12 in the Little League, and then a year later, he, he set a home run record that still stands today. He's just a good hitter. It has nothing to do. Angel would not do that. And as I'm talking, I'm looking at the interview's face, and his face is dropping. He expected me to agree with him. Immediately, he says, that's a wrap. He takes the camera. <laughs> he, he takes the camera and says, leave. Anyway, to make a long story short, longer, Andrew Stendion, subsequent studies show that uh, 300 milligram dose slightly raised testosterone in men. It, it worked. It actually did. The only problem was it raised estrogen far greater, like five times greater in men. So that turned out to be a bust. But they, you know, because Andrew Stendion, because of the publicity with McGuire, and the fact that you know it was like the first testosterone, everybody wants a testosterone increase, and they didn't think it was as dangerous as steroids. It opened the door for a whole bunch of different, you know, one testosterone, a whole bunch of drug-based uh, testosterone. Uh, then they started taking out that book by Vita, and then what they did is really bad because they resurrected all the old, discarded, dangerous <laughs> steroids, and they marketed them as testosterone boosters. That's when the trouble really started. Right. And what were some of the well-known brand names for that? For oh, them? you know, I, uh, Di Dima something or other. Uh, I can't remember offhand. Uh, I, you know, I don't even remember. Uh, right. There was one called Dima something or other. But uh, uh, I don't even remember them, but there was quite a few. One testosterone was one of them. But the thing is that they started showing up with uh, liver failure. Li guys needed liver transplants, this and that. And after a while, it finally caught the attention of the Food and Drug Administration. And they realized that they were not supplements. They were drugs, which is illegal. You can't market a drug without approval by the FDA. So they sent warning letters. And then they finally, I think it was 2004, I believe, they started banning most of them. But then they, they, the companies were making so much money, they, they went back to the books and they came out with others. They See, the FDA list, list, uh, issued a list of the banned testosterone boosters. So what the companies did, the steroid chemists, they just went back to the book and came out with others that weren't on the list. Yeah. The FDA caught on to that 10 years later, and they amended something called the Anabolic Control Act, which was originally from 1990. This is the Anabolic, Control, uh, Anabolic Steroid Control Act of 2014, which basically banned every drug-based testosterone booster. And seeing as, they, uh, seeing as how they saw how the industry resurrected, you know, went back and just issued, you know, came out with new ones. They banned any future supplement 
that could directly increase testosterone was banned. In other words, and if you sold it, they also increased the, uh, uh, you have a 10 year prison sentence right. and a $150,000 fine. So basically anything, anything that's claiming it's doing that really is either not very effective or it's illegal. Is that exactly. kind of the two counts exactly. it falls into? But I'll tell you too, I, I was very surprised to find, occasionally I go online and I still see these drug-based steroids being sold. Yeah. Now, they don't seem to be sold in the United States. They're foreign companies. But if you have an entity connected, you can get them. Wow. I mean, uh, they're still being sold. And, you know, and I'll tell you the truth. There's, this is an important point about these steroids. Uh, they had animal research, which, again, showed mostly toxicity. There's no human research at all. So anyone who takes any of these things is a, a guinea pig. You cannot predict what's going to happen. I myself made the mistake of taking one accidentally. I'll tell you the story real quick. A friend of mine had a supplement company. Well, an, an acquaintance, not a friend. This guy was very knowledgeable in chemistry, really was. And he, he said to me, I have a new line of supplements, Jerry. I'd like to send you them. I said, sure. And he says, uh, I'm going to send you this one here. I can't remember the name of it. He says, this is going to make your testosterone grow through the roof. Now, at the time, I was already in my 50s, and I figured my testosterone was dropping. I was still working out. I'll try it. Why not? It's not a steroid. So I tried it, and uh, you know, he, sent, he told me exactly the directions how to take it. I took it, and I remember the first two weeks, I, for some reason, I thought it would work right away, but I didn't feel anything. I didn't get any stronger, nothing, no increase in libido, all the things you'd expect from testosterone I didn't feel. And then I was talking to a guy in the gym one day, this is after about two weeks, and I'm loading up a leg press machine, and I meant to put on the warm-up weight, but I was looking at him as I was talking, and I kept loading the plates on. I realized I had more weight than I used, even in my maximum sets, and I kept looking at him and getting under the machine. I pumped out 15 reps with a weight that I previously couldn't get two reps with. Wow. That's when I said, uh-oh, something's <laughs> happening here. And I remember the incline dumbbell curl, I went from using 45 pounds to 60 pounds, and my arms got bigger than my head. I said, this stuff is really working. And it's not even a drug. This stuff is amazing. And I, and I said to him, I'm going to go have a lab test done. My testosterone is going to be through the roof. I can't wait to see it. So I go have the uh, lab test done. Two days later, I get a call from the doctor. He says, Mr. Brainham, he says, uh, we got the results of your testosterone. I said, How, must have been, what was it, through the roof? He says, sir, your testosterone. <laughs> your testosterone was lower than a four-year-old girl. <laughs> he says, he says you're, no, you're literally making no testosterone. They have something called inhibitory. There's a, uh, a, a testosterone axis. If you take exogenous anabolic steroids of testosterone, a sig your body detects it. It stops releasing luteinizing hormone. Your body stops making testosterone. But among the side effects, if your body stops making testosterone, is your testes shrink. <laughs> And sure enough, I went to have an examination by uh, an endocrinologist. And he says, Mr. Brainham, I don't know if you noticed this, but your testes are really small. I said, you're kidding me. And I, I, I had just gotten off you know, that, that, that supplement. You know? And I, I said, well, something's wrong. These are all the symptoms of, of, you know, of high testosterone. And so sure enough, about two months later, somebody analyzed this product and it had a designer steroid in it that was uh, issued by, I don't, you remember something called the Balco scandal? No. There was a guy named Victor Conti up in the San Francisco area who was giving out drugs that could not be detected by drug tests to major, some of these are top Olympic athletes. Uh, I can't remember the name. You know, they won many gold medals. I can't remember offhand. Uh, the baseball player, the guy who holds the record, Barry Bonds, he was one of his uh, subjects. He was giving him these drugs that are called designer steroids that are not actually detectable by the, the current drug testing. Now they are, but at the time they weren't. The one supplement I took was one of those drugs. So I, I took an anabolic steroid, but it was without realizing it. Okay. And it did cause severe side effects. It took me about four months for my testosterone to, uh, to catch up. And my, luckily, my testes went back to normal too, but so what do you think about you know, steroids? Because I know now, certainly in America, you don't get them. I've not seen them many other places, but you have these replacement 
um, centres where you have yeah. testosterone replacement for people as they get older. Right. How, how do you, like, your, your view, you obviously know a lot about this, but what's your, initially, your view on steroids, yes or no? And, and if there are any kind of cases, what are the cases where you would recommend them? Um, okay. Okay, you're talking about testosterone replacement therapy. There's a definite place for that because in men, testosterone starts, most men starts dropping about age 30. It's a, uh, you, lose, you, you lose about 1% per year. So in many men, by the time they hit 40, and it varies, some men drop a little faster than others. Uh, in most men by 40, they're leaning towards having low testosterone on the testosterone lab scale, which is 300 to 1,000. In other words, if you're within that range, you're considered normal. If you're under 300, you're considered low testosterone. A doctor will not prescribe testosterone unless you're under 300. Uh, although some people, some doctors consider the 300 normal, which it really isn't. You can't build any muscle on that. So anyway, uh, that's the indication for uh, testosterone replacement therapy. However, uh, you really have to be careful about that because once you go on testosterone replacement therapy, it's not something like where the body blows go on and off steroids. You know, they take it before a contest and they get off it. With testosterone therapy, you're not making testosterone anymore. You have to stay on it. So what you, want to have, what you want to ensure is that you are genuinely deficient. That takes three testosterone tests. They used to tell men to take them early in the morning because testosterone in men peaks between 8 and 10 a.m. Now they know that it makes no difference. You right. can have your lab test done any time. It doesn't make any difference. But you do want to have three tests done just to ensure that you really need the testosterone. The second... And, re and the reason because of that is once you make a decision to say, okay, I'm going to use it, then like your previous story, is, is you're, you're going to then sort of make your natural ability even worse than probably what it was previously. Is that well, right? you're using it because you're not making testosterone. Right. In other words, there's nothing to go back to. There's okay. nothing there. If you, if you go on testosterone or TRT, if you go on TRT and you say, well, I don't want to do this anymore, then just like the, uh, you know, the, the fairy tale where the coach turns back into a pumpkin, well, <laughs> your, your testosterone goes back to nothing. Right. It but is there a danger that if it was a little bit there... Does it, and then you try it, does it actually sort of make the little that was there yeah, even well, worse? That's a good point. If you're still, if your body is still capable of making testosterone and you go on testosterone, you will inhibit your testosterone. <clears throat> and if you stay on it a long time, you could have a permanent thing where you're going to have to stay on testosterone. Oh. Now, there's ways around that. If you take a, uh, let's say, well, let's, let's do an ex example. You're a young man, right? Um, bodybuilder or recreational exerciser and you think that you can't get muscles without taking steroids which to me is ridiculous but let's just give the benefit of the doubt say I, he wants to take testosterone right but you, you, you know you're a young guy you want to get married and have children you've heard that testosterone makes you infertile which is true your sperm, sperm can't go down to nothing it's called oligospermia so what do you do what you do is you take an you take another drug, an injectable drug called human chorionic gonadotrophin. That basically is almost identical to, H, uh, to luteinizing hormone. Right. If you take small amounts of that while you're on testosterone, it'll keep your testes alive. H, what is that, HGH? They H, call it. This is HCG. HCG. Yeah. It, it'll keep your latex cells alive. So if and when you decide to get off testosterone, you will have, you'll be able to sire children. Now, if you're one of those guys that worries about the shrunken testicles, some guys, you know, they think women are going to laugh at them, whatever. I don't believe that's true, but that's besides, I mean, I, a woman who would laugh at a guy because he has small balls, you don't want to be with her anyway. But that, that's, that's a different story. And she's telling you something, that's a red flag. But the point, <laughs> the point is that if a guy is concerned about that and he wants to take steroids or, or testosterone, you take the HCG, it'll keep your... Uh, testes size normal because okay. you know, as long as the testes is getting a luteinizing hormone, it has no reason to atrophy. See, right. it only atrophies when you take the pure drug. So, so <clears throat> in, in terms of that yes or no then, and, and, and I know different people have got different views, but in your mind, you know, knowing everything you've done, even if somebody wants to build muscle and maybe they compete, in general, is it not worth the risk to you to do it, or are there certain circumstances if you're, you're kind of guided that, you know, okay, maybe you can do it in the right situation? You mean without drugs? No, well, no, is it like the yes or no question, because there's lots of people saying, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe I can, if I want to improve my performance mm -hmm. or 
build muscle, maybe it's worth taking the risk. You know, you've been in, you've been and seen yeah. more than most people right. alive have seen. Like, where what what would your professional view be? Is it yeah. worth taking it or? Would you absolutely say just stay as far away from them as you, as you possibly can? If you're a high-level elite athlete, whether it's sports or bodybuilding, and you want to compete at an elite level, it's absolutely necessary. There's no other way. Uh, years ago, like let's take bodybuilding for instance. I was just talking about this yesterday. Wait, in, in the 90s, it was possible to be a professional bodybuilder and compete drug-free. There was a couple of them. There was a guy named Mike Ashley. There was a guy named Gene Paul Giarm. These guys took no drugs, and they were adamant about it. If you accuse them of taking drugs, they'd, get, they, they'd start yelling, and I'll take a drug test. I knew the guys. They were adamant about it. And they were not big guys, but they were very muscular. Unfortunately, the way bodybuilding has transmogrified in the past couple of years, where you have these you know, 300-pound monsters on the stage, I mean, it's impossible. Now, that's just body mode, but in other sports, I could tell you that contrary to popular belief, Steroid use is universal in sports. Even chess players, don't ask me why. Even chess players take steroids. Why, I don't know. That I couldn't answer. But it's universal. Almost Bowlers, bowlers take steroids. Why, I don't know. But they take steroids. It's universal. Okay. So my, to answer your question, if you want to compete on an elite level, even with, if you have the, the genetics, if you're a naturally good athlete, if you're a naturally a muscular bodybuilder, you still need to take the drugs to compete on an evil nut. There's no way around it. Okay, so if you do that then, um, and I, I, you know, it seems as though a lot of this is kind of, uh, maybe it's not, but in my mind, it's still kind of an under the table thing. Is, is there good ones and bad ones out of everything that it's like, okay, if, some, if you meet someone in a locker room and they're saying you should do this and mm -hmm. it seems to be worth the, the risk, you know, what, what would be, a, you know, a couple of good places and what would be, definitely don't touch that. Right. There's certain drugs uh, are, that are far more dangerous than others. Right. Uh, for example, just right off the top, oral anabolic steroids, all of them, even the ones that are considered safe, like Anavar and Winstrol, two trade names, uh, they, if you, it depends on uh, any drug, it depends on time and dosage, any pharmacologist will tell you. It depends on how long you take them and how much you take them. The, the higher the dose, the more dangerous it's going to be, mainly to liver function. We're talking about oral steroids. And also cardiovascular function. Again, the larger the amount, the greater the risk. Uh, now, a, lot of the, a great myth among athletes and bodybuilders is that injectables are safe because they bypass the liver. Not so. What they have to realize is everything winds up in the liver. Yes, initially, if you take a testosterone or an anabolic steroid, a nandrolone injection, it will bypass the liver, and, but it eventually has to be degraded in the liver. And if you take enough, I mean, they're talking about taking several thousand milligrams a week. That's all going to wind up in the liver, and that's far beyond the capacity of the liver to handle. It's going to cause liver damage eventually. But to answer your question directly, certain steroids are far more immediately dangerous than others, even whether they're oral or injectable. An example of the oral version that's dangerous, and I don't want to, I shouldn't mention this, but he said it publicly, so I guess I can. Dorian used a drug called Anadrol 50. He's mentioned this publicly, so I'm not betraying anything. Uh, I've seen him say it several times. He talked about how it gained tremendous size and strength. It does. It's a very powerful drug. Anadrol 50, it's called. Uh, oxomethylone, I believe, is, is, the, uh, is the generic name. But it's also extremely hard on the liver. Uh, if you take it more than, let's say, um, uh, six weeks, you're going to start to break down the, your hepatocytes, your liver cells. And that can lead to scarring, cirrhosis, liver damage, liver cancer, uh, peliosis hepatis, which is blood cysts in the liver. Horrible, horrible thing to have. Uh, so that's you know, an example. What's that one? Anadrol. That's Anadrol 50, yeah. Right. Uh, there's another one, uh, uh, it's the fluoride-based one, I can't remember the, Halitestin. Halitestin. Hal Halitestin is a, a so-called cutting drug. A bodybuilder who, <laughs> I, I'm sorry I'm laughing, but you, this notion that certain drugs will cut you up more than others is laughable to me. I mean, that's not the way it works, but it's, it's gen a general belief, let's say it that way. Halitestin is a fa uh, very popular cutting drug used shortly before a bodybuilding contest. Unfortunately, it's also hard on the liver. 
The good news, halitestin is usually only used for short periods, maybe the last three or four uh, weeks. Again, uh, under the notion that it increases muscularity. Side note about halitestin, which is very interesting. It was used by President John F. Kennedy. Yes, John F. Kennedy was on steroids. <laughs> John F. Kennedy had a condition called Addison's disease where his adrenal glands did not produce cortisone. So he had to take large amounts of cortisone to stay alive, otherwise he'd die. Cortisone causes muscle catabolism, you know, it breaks down the muscle. His doctor, Janet something, I can't remember her name, to counter, she even knew this back then in the early 60s, to counter the, this is one of the things steroids do, one of the reasons why they make you big. They block the effects of cortisol at breaking down muscle. They actually block them. And so, is cortisol, is, it, does, is, there, is there a reason why cortisol should break down muscle then? Well, cortisol is a stress hormone if you're, uh, in other words, if you're in an emergency situation, your body will break down uh, 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 the, the amino acids in muscle to send them to the liver where the amino acids immediately turn into glucose as energy. It's, okay. It serves as a life an emergency. Saving, emergency, right, exactly. Okay, okay. But in other cases, if you're not in an emergency situation and you have a high cortisol level, unfortunately, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you're under a lot of constant stress, your cortisol, you're in danger of losing muscle right. and also of breaking down the neurons in the brain. The cortisol is terrible for your brain neurons. Oh. It, it, it causes, they think it's the main cause of what they call senior moments. People who are a little older where they forgot where they put their keys. They think that's some years and years of cortisol break down Stress. neurons in the wow. hippocampus. Anyway, that's another story. But the point being that, that uh, so Kennedy, uh, the doctor, Janet Travell, her name was, she gave him, uh, she gave him testosterone propionate, halitestin, and one more steroid. He was on three anabolic steroids. President John F. Kennedy was a steroid user. I always get a kick out of that. It's an interesting thing, but... The point is that halitestin's a bad one. Yeah, halitestin. But now getting to the injectables, by far, and this is really ironic because this particular steroid happens to be, if you said to me, what is the most popular underground steroid in the world right now? What is the one that's most sought after? Immediate answer, Trenbolone it's called. Trenbolone. Trenbolone uh, uh, it was a drug very briefly released as a human drug and then taken off the market. Uh, Trenbolone was then kind of repackaged to use as a veterinary drug. It was made into pellets, injected into cattle. But Trenbolone is an extremely powerful steroid. It is. It puts a lot of muscle on. It doesn't turn into estrogen. It doesn't, it's almost a holy grail for bodybuilders. Builds muscle, loses fat. Uh, you know, this and that, and it's very sought after. As I said, it hasn't been made by any legitimate pharmaceutical company <laughs> in about 50 years. It's only available on these black market endosets, internet sites. Uh, for a while, uh, they, uh, body bullets, uh, they, they, they were uh, online, they were giving the recipe of how to turn the pellet, animal pellets, how to convert them into a form that you can inject in yourself. So these guys were doing Shit. that. They were buying animal pellets from veterinary sources uh, of Trembolone and injecting it into themselves. Then, with the advent, as the black market got, got, rose in popularity and profits, they started selling started Trembolone, producing. so they didn't have to do that anymore with the pellets. Now, here's the problem with Trembolone. Recent studies, and I've said this, I'm, I think I'm the only person saying this, I don't know why, Trembolone is the only steroid they found thus far, and this is animal experiments, it causes a buildup of abnormal proteins in the brain called tau and beta amyloid, which are the underlying causes of Alzheimer's disease. It also increases alpha-synuclein, which is another protein which causes Parkinson's disease. What does that mean in practical terms? It's so far shown in about five animal studies. One, different species all had the same effect. They were given trenbolone, and you want to put this in italics, in doses equal to about what these bodybuilders are using. What's gonna to happen to these guys? I don't know, but I, I'm warning them, if you keep using Trenbolone- And that's the popular after, one that people are using at the moment. The most popular, the most. I've been cursed online. When I said this in another video where I talked about Trenbolone about a year ago, people were calling me all kinds of names saying I'm full of crap, don't listen to this guy. What titles has he win? Blah, blah, blah. You know, they got absolutely angry at me because I was, you know, telling them the truth. 
They couldn't handle it. Like that movie says, you can't handle the truth. They couldn't handle the truth. So, you know, my point is, I don't know what's going to happen to these guys in the future, but it doesn't bode well. You know, I mean, you know, these animals have short lifespans, so the, the, the brain defects showed up sooner. And in, a, in a human, it might take longer. But if you're taking Trembolone year after year, if you start in your 20s, you're still taking it into the 40s, maybe by 50, you'll be completely gone brain-wise. You know, you won't even know who your wife is. I mean, is it worth that risk? I say no. <laughs> so that is the most, uh, that to answer your question, by far, the most dangerous uh, injectable steroid, by far. Most of the injectables are, uh, tend to be on the safer side, as long as you don't go crazy. What are, what are the sort of like, if you had to choose one or two, what would be the ones that you would probably want to start with? Well, not, that's probably the wrong thing, but what were the ones that would be the safer of the bunch if you were to do it? Okay, there's a couple of, uh, of course, testosterone itself in, uh, in uh, judicious amounts is good. Uh, if you start to go crazy with testosterone, there was a bodybuilder named Dallas McCarver. He was a top pro, destined to win the Mr. Olympia, tremendous physique, huge, gigantic guy, about 270 pounds. He was taking, the, they, he was taking off season 15,000 milligrams of testosterone a week. The, the human male produces one to 11 milligrams in the body. He was taking 15,000, he dropped dead. Now, again, I'm not gonna say to you it was cause and effect, that that level of testosterone killed him. Turns out he had a genetic uh, uh, tendency to cardiovascular in his family. He should never have been taking steroids in the first place, but, but that's another story. But the point being that testosterone in normal amounts, like for example, as I mentioned, testosterone replacement therapy in the dose that they give the men, they've looked at it now for 25, 30 years now. Completely safe. It does not cause prostate cancer. There's no apparent, there's a little bit of controversy about it with cardiovascular disease, there's some, some, there's some studies indicating it might cause a little damage to the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels, but you know, they're really not sure of that. That's a possibility. Thus far, you know, no man who's been on testosterone replacement therapy has died directly as a result of that, let's put it that way. So judicious amounts of testosterone are safe. Another one called decadrablin, nandrolone, is a usually a safe steroid. Again, uh, I've seen massive doses uh, suggested online that will mess you up really bad. You never want to take nandrolone if you're competing as an athlete or a bodybuilder in a drug-tested contest because nandrolone leaves what they call markers that can be detected by drug tests two years after you stop using it. You can be busted for nandrolone two years. In fact, there's been cases. Nandrolone is found naturally in muscle. It's like muscle meat. There's been cases where athletes, not bodybuilders, Athletes, uh, track stars, this and that, have, been, have not passed drug tests because they showed up positive for nandrolone. And it was traced back to the fact they were eating a lot of food that naturally contained nandrolone. Oh. So, you know, so, but again, uh, in, norm, in normal, other than that, it's a fairly safe, except it, it, it does, uh, in some guys, it causes an uh, 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 effect where uh, they get like impotent. Right. It doesn't have, it's not a good uh, thing to It's have. called decadic. Decadic. <laughs> that's, that's the expression. <laughs> so about a small percentage of guys when they take, uh, it's similar to another condition caused by trenbolone where they get a lot of coughing. They call it trend cough. Wow. And nobody knows the cause of that. They think that the trend somehow irritates, irritates the, uh, you know, the, uh, li you know, the, the lining of the uh, throat. And it causes you to cough. Nobody really knows the cause of it. There's a couple of other that I see online. Is is SARMs? What's SARMs, yeah. Select. Oh, okay. Sele selective androgen receptor modulator. SARMs. That's what it stands for. SARMs originally came out in the late '40s. Now, what SARMs are? Uh, when they say selective androgen receptor modulator, all testosterone, all anabolic steroids interact with the androgen receptor. There's only one androgen receptor. But estrogen has two to three receptors. That's the difference. So all drugs, the anabolic steroids or testosterone itself, they interact with the androgen receptor. Now, the fact is that uh, testosterone and anabolic steroids, of course, have side effects. Cardiovascular. Some people still talk about prostate problems and this and that. So scientists wanted a way to get the benefits. You see, uh, testosterone provides anabolic effects and androgenic effects. The anabolic effects are the building of the muscle, the building of bones. Androgenic effects are hair growth, sex drive, growth of sex organs, 
acne, this type of thing, male pattern baldness, all this and that. They wanted to develop a drug that will give you the, that focused on the anabolic effects of testosterone, but somehow downplayed not the, the androgenic effects to nothing. But the way to do this, it had to interact with the androgen receptor. So they developed these drugs in the 40s that, sure enough, the original, they, sure, they interacted directly with the androgen receptor, didn't seem to cause any of the liver problems, the, the adverse effect on blood lipids. But for some reason, it, it went into limbo. Nothing happened with it. I don't know why. I couldn't tell you why. Just nothing happened with it. They just shoved it aside. I guess maybe the drug companies didn't want to market it. That's the only thing I could guess at. In the late 90s, another, a, a top uh, steroid chemist, he came out with new SARMs that were more effective than the original one. These were really were good. Total interaction with the androgen receptors, no effect on blood lipids, no effect on the heart, zero effect on the prostate gland, almost no androgenic effects. And, and this was touted as the ultimate replacement for testosterone because a lot of physicians were hesitant to give men testosterone replacement because they still believe the myth that testosterone caused prostate cancer, which was based on one case published in 1941. One man right. was based on. That's it. There was no evidence. The truth of the matter is... But when you have prostate, they do lower purposely your testosterone. They do. They do. Because the prostate gland only... Uh, only accepts a finite amount of testosterone, the normal amount circulating in the blood. That's all the prostate gland ex uh, accepts. However, if you are consistently low in testosterone, then there, there's a change that occurs in the pro prostate where you could theoretically stimulate prostate cancer with testosterone, only if you start out low. That's the way it works, see? Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, so, you know, they, the problem is that doctors... They believe this thing about the prostate cancer and the cardiovascular. So they, you know, even if you came to them, Doc, I'm low on testosterone. I got all these symptoms. I'm depressed. I'm getting fat. I'm, my muscles are. I'm sorry, sir. It causes prostate cancer. This has been told to me. That I, me, doctors have said this to me. <clears throat> so they, th this seemed like an ideal answer. They could give out. They can boost these men's testosterone without the danger of prostate problems, cardiovascular, and everything. So what happened was, they're still not out. They're still experimental drugs. But here again, the internet, the guys on the internet heard about this and they, ah, it works like this steroids, it. but it doesn't cause the side effects. We could get big using this stuff and don't have to worry about this stuff. So they started selling it in the black market. It's available all over the world. You can get anywhere. So they're selling SARMs on the black market. But, there's a, but the problem is, in their ads, which I've looked at, because I've written a couple of articles on SARMs, they're very devious and they lie. For example, they say that, you know, when you take testosterone antibiotic steroids, as I said earlier, it cuts off your, your uh, endogenous testosterone, stops. There's a signal sent, stops, your body stops making testosterone. They say in their ads that unlike testosterone and antibiotic steroids, SARMs do not cut off your natural testosterone. Lie. Really? They do. Okay. That's one of the problems. That's probably one of the reasons why the drug companies haven't released SARM, because they do cut off your natural testosterone. That's a problem, mm. especially with the guys like you were asking about earlier who still make their own testosterone. But that didn't stop them. They started selling the SARMs. They're available all over. It was a safe steroid. A safe, a safe. Right. They're selling it as a safe steroid, and they're, saying, and they're comparing some of them. Uh, RAD, I think it's RAD11. I can't remember the exact name. But... There have been some studies showing, sure enough, that this produces anabolic effects equivalent to oral anabolic steroids. Some of them really are strong. But the problem, now you say, well, well that, that sounds pretty good. What, what could be the problem? Hmm. Besides the fact that it turns off your own testosterone, the major problem is the, 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 uh, uh, a couple of uh, researchers bought 50 SARMs from various black market sources on the internet and they analyzed them, right? 50% of them had no SARMs at all. <laughs> Another 20% of them had stuff in it that wasn't SARMs, stuff like DHEA, androstenedone, which they resurrected, but they weren't SARMs. So basically, I'm not saying all the SARMs are, that are sold on the internet are fake, but the problem is right now it's a crapshoot. Yeah. I mean, these are not legitimate companies selling it, so you don't know what you're getting. 
And that holds true for any black market drug. They're not, there's no quality control. Where do you go? Because I know you've said about, you know, they should legalize steroids, so at least there's a certain amount of control yeah. in it. Like, where, if, you, if you do want to get it, like, where is a good place to go and get it? Because you said the doctors don't really know a lot about it either. Like, is, yeah. is there, are there places that, you, you know, you can go to do this properly? Unfortunately, the answer would be no. Yeah. Because uh, I personally would not trust, I don't, I'm not interested in steroids. I have no reason to take them. You know? <laughs> but let's say I was a young bodybuilder. I swear to you, I, I, w I would be very wary of black market drugs for two reasons. First of all, again, you don't know, there's no quality control. These, those drugs have likewise been analyzed. A lot of them, again, show either a completely different drug, no drug, or worst of all, contamination with things like heavy metals. Mm. One young Australian bodybuilder, normal good health, 30 years old, bought an underground steroid. It was actually Trenbolone, as a matter of fact. He bought it, injected himself, and he died. It turned out it was, it was, it was contaminated with arsenic. Why is arsenic in a steroid? I don't know, but it's probably due to a lack of quality control. Drug companies, when they make, you could say what you want about pharmaceutical companies. I hate them. They overcharge, they're bad, they're bad people, I will admit. But there's one thing you have to say about them. They are very careful about quality control, very hygienic, there's no germs, when they, there's, everything has to be, or else they're closed down by the government in a snap. Yeah. So they're very, this doesn't apply to the black market. <laughs> they could be made in some guy's dirty bathtub. You, you don't know, or in his basement with dust all over the place. You don't know what's in that stuff. So this, this applies to any black market drug. So, the majority of steroids being sold today, sadly, are from black market sources. Now, a lot of them are real. I'm not going to tell you they're all fake, but again, it's a crapshoot. Some of them could be fake, fake. Some of them could be tainted. You know, you're, you're taking your you, chances. You don't know. There's yeah. no traceability right. or, yeah. or anything like that. If you yeah. want real steroids, unfortunately, the only source is you'd have to go to a doctor, who a physician, who's willing to give you a prescription. And, you know, there's a couple you could still... Anivar is available, testosterone, of course, at DECA. There's a couple that are still made by real drug companies, and they're pure drugs. They're available. They're real. Uh, uh, the problem is that doctors, because of the Drug Enforcement Agency, when they issue a prescription for an uh, anabolic steroid drug, it's what they call a triplicate prescription. In other words, one of the copies goes directly to the Drug Enforcement Agency, oh. and they monitor this. If a physician is seen to be giving out an unusual amount of anabolic steroids, they will build up a case against him, go and raid him, close him down, take away his license, and put him in prison. Right. Most doctors, you know, if you know what it takes to become a physician, well, the medical school and the training, they're not willing to risk that to give a bodybuilder steroids. <laughs> so my point is good luck trying to get steroid <laughs> prescriptions from uh, uh, a... Uh, there, there's a couple I know of in this town that are willing to do that, you know, but, you know, luckily, they've been lucky. I mean, nobody has gotten in trouble or, you know, if, if one of their patients gets sick, they could be in big trouble. That's, yeah. that's another problem. It's a big risk. But supposedly these doctors are monitoring these guys. They're giving them blood tests. They're watching them. So usually it's safe. Yeah. I will say that if you do manage to somehow get steroids under a physician's supervision, they, the physician is going to demand that you take regular medical tests, blood tests, so you probably will be okay. The odds of you, unless, the only problem is if you have some sort of genetic time bomb, like Dallas McGarver had with his cardiovascular problem, nobody knows. I mean, you don't know. We could all walk around with, with these damaged DNA cells or, you know, you don't know. You don't know until, until something turns them on. Yeah. I always use the example of something called oncogenes. Oncogenes are growth genes. They, they, they are on various organs. They cause them to grow and develop normally. But sometimes you have misplaced oncogenes that are organs that they're not supposed to be. They just sit there. They don't cause, they don't cause any changes in the organs, but it's like I always compare it to a, a gun where you, you kind of like, like cock the gun, but you haven't pulled the trigger yet. They're ready to go. If something turns them on, they, they, they cause cellular mut mutations, and that organ becomes cancerous. So, but you never know where they are. There's no medical tests. There's no nothing, and that that's one of the dangers of using these kind of drugs. See, what what is uh, growth hormone then? Like uh, synthetic? I don't mean like what you have in your own body. What's that? Is that a, a safer version, or is that equally as bad as like a, a steroid? 
interesting story about growth hormone. Uh, the original growth, I believe the uh, growth hormone was first isolated in 1957. Now, the original source of growth hormone was cadavers. They literally took growth hormone from dead people, they, from their pituitary gland, and they sold that. Uh, Crest Corman, I think, was one of the names, the trade names. And this was the original growth hormone that was used all the way till the mid-80s. Uh, Mid-80s? Huh? Mid-80s? Yeah. Wow. Fine and dandy. There was only one problem. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. It's not funny. Around 1980, a uh, disease started showing up. Uh, it was what they call a prion disease. Prions are not bacteria, they're not virus, but they're organisms that, that can cause severe brain disease. You know, uh, and um, uh, you might have heard of mad cow disease. Yeah. In uh, England, we, we yeah, had that. Yeah, that's a prion true. disease. Right. In humans, it's called Kreuzfeld Jakob, Kreuzfeld Jakob. And it turns out that, unfortunately, the growth hormone, the original growth hormone, the bodybuilders didn't catch on to growth hormone until around 1980. Uh, from 75 till 80, it wasn't even used by body, like Arnold, all those guys. They didn't use growth hormone. What it was used for was to treat, uh, the only medical indication of growth hormone is to treat a form of dwarfism. A dwarfism. Mm -hmm. It was used in children to treat, that's it. Unfortunately, a couple of cases, <coughs> excuse me, of Kreuzfeld Jakob disease started turning up. And they traced it to the, you know, these people that died. It was in their brain, and unfortunately, it had infiltrated their pituitary glands, wow. and it was in the, unfortunately, they didn't purify it enough. It was in the actual growth hormone. So, you know, that was a problem. I mean, because, again, now you're in some sort of death lottery where if you injected this growth hormone, it, it will either help you get bigger or kill you or, <laughs> or cause brain. And let me tell yeah. you something. Grootsfield Jakob is a very, very bad way to die. It involves, like, poking holes in your brain. It's an excruciating, horrible death from, that lingers for months. It's horrible. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I wouldn't even wish it on Donald Trump. Now, I, anyway, but the, the point is that... Uh, and I just made a bunch of enemies. No, but the point is that, uh, that uh, they had to do something. So, you know, the awareness of the fact that it could be tainted with this prion, <clears throat> they developed a, a, a bacterial... Uh, 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 method of, of producing uh, growth hormone from bacteria. Uh, uh, what's the name? I can't remember the actual scientific term. But anyway, it was artificially produced growth hormone. It appeared in 1985, and that's the way it's been ever. It's called recombinant, uh, recombinant DNA growth hormone. It's produced from, again, bacteria. They somehow produce it from bacteria. So all the growth hormone today is synthetic, and it does not have the prions. And uh, so there's no chance of getting that. Uh, the, uh, but there is other problems with growth hormone. For example, you know, you have, uh, you see people that have excess growth hormone naturally, <clears throat> a condition called acromegaly, which is caused by a small tumor called the adenoma on the pituitary gland that causes the release of excess growth hormone. They look normal till they hit around the teen years. And then, you know, they start growing longitudinally. They get taller and taller and the facial bones grow and the tongue grows and their hands become enormous. And, uh, you know, they, these are the people that are at seven, you know, well over seven foot, seven five, and over, the, it's almost always acromegaly. Almost anyone over seven, five, uh, seven foot tall has a degree of acromegaly, although some of them don't have the disfigurement of the face that some people have. <clears throat> these people usually don't live long. They usually die of cardiovascular disease, or for some reason they have an increased rate of colon cancer. They think it's related to the IGF-1, which has produced some growth hormone. IGF-1 stimulates cell mitosis, Cell division, and cancer is a disease that involves excessive cell, cell division. Yeah, but that's kind of not, they're really not sure. The point is they usually, the average age of death of someone with acromegaly is 50. So wow. they don't live long. Now, um, now the, as for the athlete, now the, the, <laughs> the doses that the athletes are taking are mind boggling. I mean, they use something like one tenth of a year. When, when they started giving out growth hormone replacement therapy to older people, it's used for two reasons. Some people believe growth hormone is a fountain of youth. Based on a 1990 study by a guy named Daniel Rudman, published in the New England Journal, where he, get, he took 14 men with diagnosed growth hormone deficiency. <clears throat> he put them on growth hormone, and it looked like they turned back the clock. They lost body fat, 14% body fat. Skin got thicker, so their facial lines started disappearing. Their muscles started growing. They started working out harder. And, and, and uh, you know... Miracle Sudden, drug. Right, and, and suddenly <laughs> the whole industry began. The growth hormone as 
fountain of youth began. All these anti-aging clinics sprouted. What they didn't tell you, again, they leave out the small print. <laughs> when the men got off the growth hormone, everything reverted back to normal. Right. All the gains they made, body fat came back, muscle shrank, lines in the face, went back to normal. You have to take growth hormone all the time. Mm. So when they first started giving out, but these people still believe, they would not be swayed from the belief that growth hormone was a fountain of youth. There was a big demand for it. Then you have the other category of people that are just deficient in growth hormone. If you're completely deficient in growth hormone, you have stuff like congestive heart failure, you have brain problems, it's bad. These people need some growth hormone. So those are the two categories, the youth seekers and the de genuinely deficient. So when they first started giving out growth hormone, they gave the same dose of growth hormone to older people that they were giving to the dwarves. Unfortunately, that proved to be too much. The older people were getting stuff like carpal tunnel syndrome. They were getting gynecomastia, which is breast formation in the men. And they realized they had to cut back. After a couple of years, they experimented. They came out with the right dosage. It's something like one-tenth the amount that they give to treat dogs. Uh, with that dose, the growth hormone is safe. They've, uh, they've done studies of 20 years of growth hormone replacement, no cancer, no side effect. They were, some of the, they were trying to say growth hormone causes leukemia. There was no evidence of that whatsoever. There's still no evidence of that. Uh, but the problem uh, is that bodybuilders use much more growth hormone. I've heard stories of anywhere from, uh, I believe Dorian himself talked about using four to eight units a day of growth hormone. Now think about that, that's massive. That alone is a massive amount. But, but I've heard of uh, other bodybuilders using 25 to 30 units, which is completely unknown territory. But I'll tell you what, they're in trouble because growth hormone is known. It's a, uh, they just recently found out large amounts, not normal, large doses of growth hormone increase a substance called lipoprotein small a, which is similar to low-density lipoprotein. It's a type of uh, cholesterol carrier, you can say, that when, it's in, it, when it rises in the blood, it increases the risk of, of a sudden death from heart disease five times more than normal. Growth hormone increases that quite a bit. So, you know, these guys that are taking the massive doses of growth hormone, and by the way, most of them, almost always all of them get carpal tunnel. Some famous bodybuilder, I don't want to mention these, but you, know, you probably know these guys, they've all had to have surgeries because the carpal tunnel is basically this little uh, connective tissue that where the medial nerve, it runs through into the hand, it enervates some of the fingers. And when you take, you see, growth hormone stimulates connective tissue growth. Right. In fact, <clears throat> they've shown in study, you know, people think growth hormone is a big muscle builder. It actually doesn't increase muscle that much. What it does is it thickens connective tissue, and there is connective tissue in muscle. It also increases the water content of muscle. So if you combine the connective tissue and the, mu and the water, it, it looks like you have bigger muscles. But you know, growth hormone is great for connective tissue. If you have a connective tissue industry, uh, in, uh, injury like a tendon ligament, you take growth hormone, you're gonna he heal about three times faster than normal because of the growth hormone effect. Unfortunately, it stimulates like the connective tissue where you won't, don't want it, like that carpal tunnel, makes it too thick, it starts to impede on the medial nerve. Now you lose, you, you can't, you lose feeling in your hand. Oh, wow. So you have to have a surgeon go in and cut that little connective tissue to free the median nerve. So most bodybuilders who've taken large amounts of growth hormone get carpal tunnel syndrome. It's very common. Right. That's probably the most common. The other one is almost always happens is what they call hyperglycemia. Growth hormone stimulates the release of fat, free fatty acids. Uh, you know, that's where growth hormone gets a reputation of being a fat burner. It does, it really does. Unfortunately, when you have a large amount of free fatty acids in the blood, you tend to get this a thing, a, a thing called insulin resistance, uh, not to the point of causing diabetes, although it could, it, it's a precursor for diabetes, but uh, it actually, uh, uh, it, 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 it causes some problems, uh, some, some medical problems. So what the bodybuilders do is um, they use insulin to, uh, they take insulin to, to count, they actually inject insulin to counter, because insulin immediately lowers glucose, they take the insulin to counter the elevated blood glucose caused by the growth hormone. Secondarily, insulin stimulates glycogen formation, and glycogen is stored carbohydrate. It's stored with, in the muscle, each gram is stored with 2.7 grams of water. When you have a lot of glycogen in muscle, you get a fuller looking muscle. That's the whole purpose of carbohydrate loading. You might have heard about that. Right. That's to increase the glycogen. Insulin does do that. That's the secondary reason. And the third reason <clears throat> is that Insulin 
by itself is not very anabolic. It's anti-catabolic. In other words, it has a remarkable effect at preserving muscle. It really does. This is one of the reasons why diabetics have problems with. They don't have enough insulin. They start to lose muscle because insulin helps to preserve muscle. It can help prevent sarcopenia, that loss of muscle with age. So, uh, but, but the thing is that, that uh, uh, with, with the, uh, when you take insulin alone, it, it's anti-catabolic, but it's not very anabolic except under one circumstance. If you have a lot of amino acids circulating in the blood, one of the functions of, of insulin is to push amino acids into muscle. So if you have a lot of amino acids, insulin will be a little bit anabolic. Not as much as people think. But it's a strange thing happens when you take three drugs together, insulin, growth hormone, and anabolic steroids, there's some sort of synergistic effect that nobody's been able to figure out where all three of them become more anabolic than either one alone. <laughs> and that triumvirate of drugs, as I call it, is what's responsible for these giant bodybuilders you see today. <laughs> these guys that are walking on stage weighing 270, that's the reason. Those are the drugs. Right. <clears throat> then you got the side effects like the big belly. Yeah. That's, Dorian, he, he had that for a while. He attributed it to insulin. I would tend to agree with him. <clears throat> some people say it's some overeating. <clears throat> you know, they say these bodybuilders shovel so much food that it stays in the stomach. But you know, what they're saying there is that you're not digesting the food. I mean, if you're eating all these meals and they're just sitting there, you got a bigger problem than growth hormone. Yeah. You, you're not digesting your food. You better get to a hospital because you probably have an intestinal blockage. So that's a nonsensical uh, thing. Insulin makes more sense. So, so natu natural insulin then, that, that stops the buildup of muscle or it allows the buildup build of muscle? Yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah it, it's, uh, it's what they call permiss uh, it's a permissive uh, drug. In other words, it favors uh, the retention of muscle. Right. But it's not its, itself nearly as anabolic as people believe. So when you, when you, have, like, um, when you have like high glucose levels, if you're eating incorrectly <clears throat> then, mm -hmm. um, does, does that, how does the sort of play of insulin and glucose happen as it relates to your diet and then muscle? I know I'm kind of going off in a bit yeah. of a tangent, but I've got, I've got these levels... Uh, um, glucose monitor, and, it, and I kind of look at what happens with yeah. your insulin and with your glucose. Yeah. Just, just curious on right. Well, the, we the uh, are you asking if, if insulin is anabolic under the so 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 is it so <clears throat> if you're if you have too much glucose in your system and yeah. and your and and your insulin isn't as effective, almost right. like going towards a diabetic. Right. Is is that which is caused by diet, does that then affect your ability to retain muscle? Yes. So you get this almost endless loop where you're losing muscle, your diet right. is causing you to lose muscle yes. because you're... Okay. Yes, right. it does. What you call, that's insulin, basically that's insulin, insulin resistance. Insulin resistance. <clears throat> yeah, and it is a, it's considered a direct precursor for diabetes type two. Doesn't mean you're gonna get diabetes. Right. You can control it with diet and exercise, and if you wanna take a drug like metformin, that helps too. But the reason why, to, to answer your question directly, why that situation where the insulin isn't working properly, is two, there's two reasons why. Uh, actually, one, it, it's, it's one basic reason. A lot of people don't know <coughs> insulin increases what they call microperfusion. It increases the, uh, the circulation of blood with, in, to the muscle fibers, the very small blood vessels that directly serve muscle fibers. And it does that by stimulating nitric oxide, which is produced in the endothelium, the lining of the blood, uh, what happens is uh, you take an amino acid called arginine. Uh, if it gets into the blood, as soon as it encounters an enzyme that's in the endothelium lining, it converts it immediately into nitric oxide, which is like a ephemeral gas. They couldn't even isolate it for years because it, 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 it's like a ghost. It appears in six seconds. It dilates the blood vessel. It's gone. They can't get it. So they used to call it endothelial relaxation factor. They knew there was something in the blood that, 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 uh, that opened up your blood vessels. They just didn't know what it was. Finally, some scientists isolated, uh, you know, they, they didn't actually get nitric oxide. They got nitrate, which is the byproduct, excreted. And that's how they knew it was nitric oxide. And that's when they started calling it nitric oxide rather than endothelial. But the point being related to insulin, insulin stimulates the nitrate. It, it stimulates microperfusion to the muscle fiber. Why is that important? Because you need that microperfusion to get the amino acids into the muscle. 
if you don't have the, enough micro perfusion into the muscles, the amino acids, now you have anabolic resistance, that's gonna cause muscle loss. You're not getting, the, if the amino acids can't get into the muscle, there's no anabolic effect. Right. So that's how insulin okay. could uh, And then that's, a, that's an endless loop where you've got less muscle, and, and you're, gonna, so you're burning less calories yeah. and your weight's gonna yeah. then continue to... In fact, they have something called the insulin resistance of aging, they call it. It has nothing to do with the normal insulin. You know, normally, people get insulin resistance for various. Usually, if you have a lot of body fat, uh, you, your, you, your uh, insulin receptors on the fat cells become less sensitive. There's other reasons. But uh, this type of insulin resistance of aging has nothing to do with that. What it's related to, strangely enough, is long-term sedentary living. Right. In other words, what happens if you are completely inactive, you know, one of these people that just sits around and does nothing, your insulin becomes less effective, and you get that lack of perfusion within the muscle, and you start to get muscle loss, which leads into sarcopenia. When they've given these old people, they tested this, you know, they the same people that gave them a normal meal, and, you know, sure enough, without, you know, they, they showed that the, they were insulin insensitive. They proved it. And they did some tests, some tracers they used. Anyway, they decided to give them some insulin and see what would happen. Completely reverted to normal. Wow. Amino acids went right into the muscle. They stopped losing muscle. For them, insulin was really anabolic. Mm. It really was. This happens to a lot of older people, which, which, which tells you, buddy, you better not stop moving. Yeah. Let me tell you, I, I, you know, I'm looking at everybody here. The worst thing you could do as you get older is sit around and do nothing. The body is a machine. It's, it's move it, uh, it's use it or lose it. If you, the old people, as soon as they lose them, this is the real danger of sarcopenia because they get so frail they can't move. That's what kills them. If you can't move, your heart goes, your brain goes, everything goes like a building falling apart. You have to move. You know, the best thing you could do is resistance training, even if it's light weights, you know. They've taken people at Tufts University years ago. These people were in their 90s. They were on walkers. I mean, they could forget it. They had to do this to lift their arm. They were so weak, you know? They started on, I don't know where they got this crazy idea. They started on a light weight training program. I mean, just crazy weight, half a pound, you know? And they started doing it. They, they had, you know, they had the trainers watching them. And they said, well, you know, the, the original hypothesis was they're too old to gain muscle. You know, we're going to just try, all they were trying to do is increase mobility. They didn't expect any muscle gain. They didn't expect any strength gain. They just wanted these people to be able to move because they knew that if they're able to move, they would live longer. And they were already in the 90s, right? What they didn't expect was the people got stronger and some started getting muscle growth. That, that was against every textbook in mankind. Every textbook, see, uh, you have something called satellite cells. These are muscle stem cells that are needed to repair muscle and stimulate muscle growth. The theory before this was that after uh, years of disuse, the muscle stem cells literally disappear. They're gone. It means that you have no chance of building muscle. What they didn't know until recently was if you start to exercise, the satellite cells are gradually regenerated. Wow. So I'm not saying these old people... If they keep training, could enter the Mr. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's no chance of that. <laughs> but let's say you talk about the guy with the walker. He threw the walker away after six months, walking normally. The, they were, all the people, crutches, all gone. They all, all regained their mobility from just basic weight training programs. Wow. That's the power of, of resistance training. I myself was extremely impressed when I read because I always believed that you know, once you're an old person, forget about building muscle. And it's true, past 70, it's much, much harder to past get big. You know. No, no, seriously, because I get questions like that. How old are you then? I'm 72, wow. forget it, I can't build any muscle anymore, I'm gone. <laughs> uh, you know, all, my goal today is to, and I tell this to people when they ask me why I still train. My, uh, a couple of reasons. Are you maintaining muscle though? Like That's that. it. Yeah. My, my goal today, if I can maintain and minimize there's always going to be a certain amount of muscle. You can't help it. Look at Arnold. Look at some of these top. You'll see that they lost muscle. You can't help that. That's the aging process. No way around that. Growth hormone won't help nothing. <laughs> Testosterone won't help. It's the way it is. It has to do with motor neuron loss, and this is a complicated thing. But if you work out with weights, you will minimize all that. You'll maintain. And if you maintain muscle and strength, they've shown in studies, 
you, you decrease your risk of mortality greatly, greatly. So what on my goal today, years ago I wanted to have 20 inch arms and Mr. America, whatever, forget it. I just want to stay healthy, ward off disease. Most importantly, I want to keep my brain yeah. because exercise, people don't understand, is very important for brain health. When you work out, you stimulate brain proteins called nerve growth factor, brain derived neurotropic factor that repair damage. You see, as you age, remember I talked about how cortisol damages neuron? Mm -hmm. Well, these proteins actually repair damaged neurons. They keep your brain going. And the way to stimulate them is exercise. Aerobics and weight training both stimulate them. You can also take some supplements. Lion's mane stimulates nerve growth. It's a mushroom, very effective at stimulating nerve growth. Uh, nerve growth. But, but you know, I, at, at this point, I, you know, I'm not a rich guy. All I have going for me, if I say so myself, is my brain. That's it. I want to keep it. Yeah. So that alone would keep me going to the gym. Forget about having you know, you know, six pack abs, all that stuff. I want to keep my brain. I want to stay as healthy as long as my. That's what keeps me going. That's when's why. the when's the cutoff point between you like the age when you can no longer build the muscle, where you got to kind of get it to where you need it to be, and then maintain it. Then what's what's that sort of age? Would you well, say? a lot of it depends on your testosterone levels. Right. If your testosterone's low. It can happen as early as 35, 30, 35 years of wow. age. Because without testosterone, you don't build muscle, period. Period. They've shown this in studies with men 19 years of age. That's when your testosterone at, at its peak level, 19. They gave them a drug that blocked all testosterone. One group didn't take the drug. The other group did take the drug that blocked testosterone. Both did the same weight training program. The group that had the testosterone blockage, zero gains. The other group gained muscle. That's how potent... Another that study I mentioned, oh, I didn't mention, in 1990, there was a big debate for years among medical researchers. They were trying to say, it was hilarious, in the 60s and 70s, they, the, the, the uh, doctors would say, testosterone doesn't build muscle, it's all water retention. And all these athletes were setting world records, and the bodybuilders were getting bigger. What are you talking about, water retention? They knew it was building muscle. But this debate went on for years until 1996, when a seminal study came out from the, new, again, New England Journal of Medicine, <laughs> where they had different groups of men. i make a long story short. They gave 600 milligrams of testosterone. I think it was, I forget what, I think it was a month. Maybe it was a week. It might have been a week. I don't remember exactly, but they gave them a testosterone. One group lifted weights. Another group didn't lift weights at all. Uh, one group did nothing at all. Another group just took testosterone and didn't do anything. The biggest surprise of the study, well, there was no surprise. The men that lifted weights and took, took testosterone made the most muscle gains. No surprise there. The big surprise came when they looked at the men that took testosterone but did no ex I mean, they did nothing. They still gained muscle. <laughs> they gained muscle sitting around doing nothing. That's how potent testosterone is. So again, you know, to answer your question, it, a lot of it depends on testosterone. There's growth hormone involved. If your levels are normal, let's say, they all start, as I said, they start to go down. Growth hormone, I think it's 14% each decade declines. By the time you hit about 50, 55, you're on the low side of your anabolic hormones. Even insulin becomes less effective. Yeah. So that's when you're going so to notice. another three years to kind of make the most. Get, get my arms up to a yeah. size and then try and maintain right. them there. Th that's, when you, that's when you'll notice that the gains. The, I'm, I'm looking not saying, forward to that. But wait a minute, I'm not saying you can't make gains, but that it's just going to come a lot slower. Right. I'll give you an example. Like this pandemic, you know, when they closed down the gyms, I was training at gym, they closed it down. All I have in my place is a stationary bike. I had no weight equipment. For the first three, four weeks, I did nothing except ride the bike. I said, the least I could do is keep my heart going. Mm. So I rode the bike. That's all I did. No resistance training. Remember, I'm a guy who trains all the time. And I said, oh, what, what, what can happen? It's only a month. Oh, okay, I'll tell you what happened. After, after three and a half weeks, <clears throat> I started getting atrophy in my... When you lose muscle, you lose it first in the peripheral areas, the calves and the forearms. Then it starts to go inward. I looked at my calves. I, my calves were shrinking by the day. My forearms looked like a bone. They were disappear, disappearing. I said, I got to do something. So I sent away for those, you know, those rubber, uh, yeah, those, bands, uh, yeah. yeah, I sent it that. They weren't bad. I, I said, you know, they, but for some reason, it just didn't give me the same feeling as weights. So I, I, I went on Facebook. I, I, I tried to buy weights. They were asking $500 for a 50 pair of 50. I said, you know, price gouging. I, no, no, I, I got to do something. So a friend of mine read about it. He brings over 80 pounds of rusty weights. 
I started, that's all I had was a barbell and, and two rusty dumbbells. I, you know, luckily all my years of training, I know what exercises to do. I had no benches, I just improvised. You know, I did whatever I could, helped, it helped, but I don't know, for some reason I couldn't get into it. So about a week later, I get this message from a friend of mine, a chiropractor, that has a gym just like this, a private training gym. He contacted me, he says, Jerry, if you want, I'll give you a key. And I went there, to make a long story short, I trained there for a year and a half while the gym closed, and I, and that's, and I maintained almost all my muscle. My point of the story is that the, the rate of muscle loss to me when I stopped training was absolutely shocking and unexpected mm -hmm. because I have laid off when I was in my 20s for as long as three months. And I'm not going to tell you I didn't lose any muscle, but it wasn't that much. Mm -hmm. And the strength was, yeah, I lost maybe 15% strength. It wasn't that much. Three weeks, it looked like three years accelerated. <laughs> oh. So my point being, when you get older, you lose muscle very, very fast, even if you're healthy, if you don't exercise. Wow. You will lose it in a flash. I mean fast. This is a warning to anyone listening to this. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get to ask you, but what was, um, there was one around, because I obviously knew a lot of those names, but there was one called Anabol. Anabol. Anabol oh, no, Anapolon 50. Yeah. It, that was a steroid. That was a steroid, That was yeah. an anabolic steroid. Anapolon. Yeah, it was... Uh, Never really caught on with uh, the, the, uh, the top bodybuilders. In England, it was popular, and it used yeah. to just bring everybody out in this yeah. terrible acne. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could do that. It was yeah. obviously Highly super androgenic. bad androgenic. for yeah. you. Very androgenic. That, uh, I don't recall whether that was... You see, they have the two basic classes of steroids. One is what they call DHT-based, and the other one is uh, not DHT-based. Right. The DHT-based, that's dehydrotestosterone, that's almost all of your androgenic effects. When you take large amounts of those drugs, that's what's going to cause hair loss, acne, yeah. and uh, in some cases, prostate problems. Right. But now, according to the most recent studies, DHT does not cause prostate problems. Right. I mean, the one circulating in the blood. Internal DHT, you see, D DHT and testosterone is produced inside the prostate gland. If too much DHT is produced in the gland, you can get benign prostatic hypertrophy. So that, that's possible, but you know, the DHT that circulates in the blood, like you get from steroids, or, or that doesn't cause prostate problems. And there was another one that, that weren't a steroid, it was called clenbuterol. Oh yeah, clenbuterol. What was that? Clenbuterol is not a steroid. It's what they call a beta-2 agonist. It's a, it was a, that was a horse thing as well, I yes. saw, an animal. Yes, it started on horses. It's a, what they call, it's a, classified as a beta agonist, drug, beta-2 agonist. Beta agonists are receptors that are found all over the body, particularly in the lung. Uh, uh, Clembutal was originally developed, it's a asthma drug. It was given to horses, as yeah. you say. And my friend, who I knew, he used to race greyhounds and he tried yeah. to give it to greyhounds, but it didn't work. Right. He, he thought he was gonna make a fortune by giving it to these yeah, greyhounds yeah. who were gonna run around the track. Right. But well, didn't. what happened was when they gave it to the horses. Horses, that was yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, they gave it to the horses and you know they didn't expect this. The horses started getting very muscular and their muscles grew. Right. And you know, this kind of stuff catches the attention of the bodybuilding world. <laughs> so it slipped into bodybuilding and uh, it was never approved for use in the United States because it's what they call a long acting beta 2 agonist, meaning it stays in your blood 48 to 72 hours. That's why it's so easily detected in a drug test. So the, the, car, the other beta 2 drugs, like I use these drugs because I have asthma, they're short acting. They last 24, maybe 12 to 24 hours maximum. And, and you know, the, again, the way it works with any drug, the longer it stays in you, the greater the chance of side effects. So the FDA never approved clenbuterol. But it was approved all over Europe, had about five or six, well, maybe 10 different traits, came in a liquid form, tablet form. Uh, and the bodybuilders started using it, but what they didn't realize, and I've written this, is that you know, the, drug, the amount of drug they give to horses was many magnitudes greater than any human could tolerate. Right. So what it boils down to is clenbuterol can cause muscle growth in large doses. But as soon as you take the doses required to have uh, increased muscle growth, you have car serious cardiovascular problems, including cardiac arrhythmias, rhythm disturbances. Oh. Now, what clenbuterol does do pretty well is uh, they use it, and this is what it's used for mostly now, a fat burner. Uh, it seems, uh, no one really is sure how, but they think it increases the efficiency of what they call catecholamines, like norepinephrine, epinephrine, they interact with fat cells to cause the release of stored fat, which you then oxidize. They think that clenbuterol is very efficient at, at increasing the efficiency of that, helping to release fat from fat. It doesn't, doesn't affect growth hormone. It just helps your fat cells release fat 
So, you know, it's very popular among the women especially mm -hmm. because it doesn't make you bigger. It doesn't make you overly muscular, but it helps them trim down. So a lot of these fitness girls and bikini girls, almost all of them use clenbuterol. <laughs> of course, they don't say this in public, but this is what I know to be true. You know. Well, that's fascinating. I could talk for hours for you. We'll have to, we'll have to get back together. Yeah. It's, uh, it was a really interesting yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are a wealth of uh, knowledge, that's <laughs> So John-John sure. didn't lie to you, huh? <laughs> he didn't. It, it, you, how many, I didn't get to ask it, but like how many years have you been sort of passionate about the, you know, the science behind a lot of this? 60. 60. Wow. 60 years. I know it sounds funny. I started this when I was about 12 years old. Really? And I've been doing it ever since. Well, you see, I, I always had this interest in... Uh, and like the mechanics, the inner workings of things, you know? And, and I like the first bodybuilder I ever met, a guy named Ray. I met him at a summer camp when I was 11. He's working on the shirt off, you know? And I, I you know, I, had, I, I hadn't seen the Steve Reeves movies. I saw them afterwards. This was the first real bodybuilder. I couldn't believe it. I never saw a guy. He looked like the comic books that I was reading, Batman and Rob, uh, Batman and Superman. I said, how did you get those muscles? He says, well, I lift weights and eat protein. That was his response. <laughs> I said, what does protein do? And he, he just, he said, look it up. And he walked in, he didn't want to talk to me. I was, he felt I was badgering. <laughs> and and I, I, I said, well, I'm gonna look at it. And I started studying it. And then my idol, the guy who just passed away, Bill Pearl, mm. uh, he had uh, recommended a book called Let e Let's Eat Right to Keep Fit by a low, uh, at that time was a famous nutritionist named Adele Davis. It was just a basic nutrition book. It talked about, you know, protein, fat. And, you know, I just started working out. And I said, wow, this is really interesting. I got more and more into it, and it never stopped. That's what started me. And uh, I tell people, if people don't believe that, I actually look through about 500 different medical papers a month wow. for the, just, for the, just for the publication. So tell us about your publication then. Okay. Applied Metabolics, as I said, uh, I started Applied Metabolics because I felt that the information, originally it was a print publication in the late 90s, uh, and uh, I, I, one of the, I was supposed to do it with two other guys. One of them was a medical doctor, but they, had to, they bowed out. I did it myself. But it was to supply accurate, non-commercial information that was completely reliable and unbiased. I felt there was a need for that because the magazines had become completely commercialized. You didn't know what was truth from fiction. Uh, then uh, when I resurrected it, you know, I, I, uh, it, it, uh, it lasted for two years of print edition. And then... It was dormant. I went back to writing for the magazine. Well, I still wrote for the magazine. Uh, and then in uh, 2014, uh, I stopped writing for the magazine and I immediately said, you know, the, the internet in the interim since the 90s, the interim had gotten so big and so different. I said, now is the perfect time to go back to applied metabolics. And I rest it took me 10 months to find webmasters that could do what I wanted. I, I went through probably 50 different so-called experts that swore they could produce what I asked them to. None of them could do it. I don't know why it was so hard. I found, the, I found this brother and sister up in Washington State, and they did it. They, they, and they, you know, they still run my website. And the thing is, uh, uh, again, the key, uh, but now it's a different focus. Not so, the magazines are just about dead, so that's not the problem. The problem now is all the garbage on the internet. You have all this, these YouTube videos and all this, you know, the, the, I mean, the misinformation and garbage I see about nutrition and, and training and general health is just horrible. It, it makes me cringe. So applied metabolics, I look at it as an antidote to all the lies and garbage that people are being handed, even by these, again, so-called uh, educated types with PhDs. And they still are handing out garbage. You know, like I said, they're paid off. I mean, I'm not involved with anybody. I, I mentioned this in my video. I'm not involved with any supplement company. Nobody pays me to say anything. I won't even write, if I have to write on a supplement, I won't even use a brand name. I will not use a brand name. I, I'm hesitant. Sometimes I'll write an article, I'll, I'll talk about whey, and somebody will send me an email. Jerry, what whey, would you, what whey, pro, what whey protein would you recommend? I don't even, I don't hesitate to even, because then they think I'm selling it. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I, all I do is I tell them the same thing I tell you. I just give a general answer. I said, look for a whey protein that has no added amino acids and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. I will not give them a brand name because I don't want to be looked at as a shill mm -hmm. because there's so many of them around, so many dishonest people. I can honestly look you right in the eye. My publication is 100% true, 100% honest. And if I'm not sure of something, 
I'll either say so in the article, or if it's really bad, I just won't write about it. So where can people find, it, find that? www.appliedmetabolics.com. Okay. It comes out every month. Uh, it's uh, issued on the first of each month, and it's uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 pages. There's no ads, just pure information. And the, good, the advantage I have, now there's a lot of good digital publications around. You know, some of these guys do have advanced degrees. They write on nutrition, training. It's good. It's good information. The problem with them is that, unlike me, they don't, have never written for the public. <laughs> They've written dissertations and, you know, yeah. maybe for journals. They, yeah, their <laughs> stuff is hard to read. Let yeah. me put it, unless you have a science background, it's like wading through thick mud to compare <laughs> it to. I have 40, well, it's about 45 years of writing experience now. So I know how to write for the public. So there's no, you don't have to reach for a medical dictionary. And everything I write is practical. You could use it today. And I, I write about, I have a huge variety of subjects. Anti-aging, ergogenic yeah, aids. Hormo yeah, hormonal it's, you therapy. Name it. Women's health and fitness. I, I try and cover the waterfront. Yeah. These other guys, they'll write about training. One guy yeah. write about nutrition. It's very broad. It's, yeah, nobody it's... covers the, the, the variety. That, that's another thing I have. So I, I, that's, I think, is the, is the key to why I, I really believe, honestly, I mean, <laughs> you know, this sounds self-serving, but I think everybody involved in, in uh, exercise and fitness, everybody should be reading Applied Metabolics and it's really useful to, per, to trainers. Yeah, I, would agree. I mean, they, there's, a, there's so much stuff they could apply to their clients. It, it, I mean, they'll look so much better to their clients if they get this level of education that I, I supply in that publication. It is, it is great. I've learned so much. And yeah. uh, you've clearly been around enough to... And um, also, it's also not expensive, which is also important. I haven't... I, I mean, I've had it now for... It's eight years going on. Eight, actually, it is eight years. September is eight years. And... Uh, I've never raised the rate. I mean, it's it's still it's thirty three cents a day it costs, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, some of my competitors or other digital, they're thirty dollars a month. Uh, there's one that really, uh, uh, this woman is a scientist. She uh, uh, issues a newsletter and uh, analysis of current medical studies for a nice little price of two hundred seventy five dollars a month. Now that is a little steep. I mean, you know. But what I charge, 10 bucks a month, I think, really, I mean, uh, I've had guys write to me. I get this all the time. They'll send me, you know, Jerry, I love your stuff. I've learned so much. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm having financial difficulties. One guy told me he had to put his mother in a nursing home. And I always, I, I, I'm never nasty to him. I say, well, I'm sorry. You know, thanks for subscribing. Uh, good luck, I'll say. But I, well, what goes through my mind is, uh, wait a minute, in other words, you paying $10 a month is going to keep your mother at the nursing home? <laughs> or oh, one guy said that, uh, you know, he had to buy a house, so he had to cancel the subscription. I'm thinking, <laughs> huh, $10, what kind of house is this guy buying where, where, where $10, $10 makes a difference? I mean, this stuff is literally life-saving. Because yeah. I write on a lot of stuff that's, you know, like cardiovascular, all this stuff, that can literally save people's life. Yeah. So, I don't know. What can I say? Check it out. Definitely. Yeah. It's some great stuff. So, Jerry, look, thanks very much for your time. Sure. I will come back. We'll, we'll sit down for dinner and we'll go into the... Yeah. I wanted to cover nutrition and training, and I think yeah. that'll probably be something for a part two. So, okay. um, thank you so much sure, for your time. Sure, it's a pleasure. Appreciate pleasure. <laughs> thanks. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.